Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. Uh, Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of interviews with spiritually awakening people. There have been over 300 of them now, and if you're new to this, you can go to batgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P, and you'll see all the old ones archived and categorized in various ways. Um, this program is made possible by the support of appreciative listeners and viewers, so if you feel like supporting it, there's a donate button there. My guest today is J.C. Teft. Um, J.C. is a former athlete, teacher, and business entrepreneur. Uh, he is now an author, producer, and teacher who corresponds with students worldwide. Um, the student himself, first of his enlightened father and later of world-renowned teachers J. Krishnamurti and Eckhart Tolle, J.C.'s own investigation into the nature of life and the universe led to realizations in pure consciousness that eventually led to the writing of his critically acclaimed book, the Christ is not a person, the evolution of consciousness and the destiny of man. He has written and produced a three episode video series entitled Pure Consciousness, The Last Frontier. It can be viewed online at jcteft.com. Um, Non-duality teachings focused on the nature of awakening into pure consciousness um, posted in the form of video shorts will be made available for viewing online in the coming years. And the way I became aware of JC was that um, I don't usually sit and watch videos on my computer, but if something looks interesting, I put it on my iPad and then watch it later on. Um, and so I was coming back from the Science and Non-Duality Conference last year, and on the plane, I decided to watch some of the videos that I had on my iPad, and so I started watching JC's. And uh, I thought, wow, these are fantastic, They're really clear and beautifully produced, and I'd like to interview this guy. So here we are. <laughs> so welcome, JC. Thanks for doing this. Uh, thanks, Rick. I, I'm uh, glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So, um, as you know, and the, but the audience doesn't yet, uh, we've exchanged a few emails over the last few days because um, I find your work so interesting and um, deep that, you know, I was having these concerns that we can't possibly cover it all and do justice to it and, and so on. And, you know, I, I, it would be fun if we could do like a one-month interview and just, you know, take a sentence, talk about it, take another sentence, talk about it. But that would kind of defeat the purpose of an interview, uh, which is meant to be more of a snapshot. So hopefully we'll just really do justice to your work in this interview. And then people, if they are interested, can watch your videos and read your book and find out more, which is the way it usually does work. <clears throat> and I recall writing to you uh, upon you posing a question or two that uh, I think the work overall has been about a 10 year process. Yeah. So for you to do, digest it for an interview in three days is a pretty miraculous job. So I thoroughly understand it's a little more than one can swallow in short order. Yeah. And, uh, and one interesting thing about it is that, you know, the work itself became a kind of a spiritual practice for you. For instance, yes. you, you said in some notes you sent me, for me, the process of researching, writing, and producing these works has been an awakening unto itself to the yes. point that I can now say that little if any ego remains that has not yet passed away. I could not have made this statement 12 years ago when the task of writing the book first began. <clears throat> so, yeah, that's interesting. Yes. So let's uh, not keep them in suspense any longer. Let's, let's tell them what we're <laughs> referring to with such enthusiasm. But maybe a good place to start would be to... Talk about you a little bit. I mean, you know, what led you to the point of writing this book and making these videos? Well, you know, I noticed uh, your site is well put where it says ordinary people <laughs> awakening, I-N-G, mm -hmm. because awakening is uh, an ongoing process. It's not something, well, oh, I'm awakened now and now I walk around, I'm an enlightened being. You yeah, know? it used to say awake, actually, and after a while uh, we realized that's wrong. You know, it should be yeah. awake, awakening, yes. so we changed it. Well, you, I, I believe you have it right at the present time. And uh, that goes back to what you just said earlier of, uh, about my case, where it has been a process, it is a process, and one realizes uh, after a while that it's an ongoing process, really, to the end of time. And... Um, uh, in talking about my story, uh, let's first establish that the story is, is not the issue really. It's not important. It's not, uh, th there's nothing valuable in the story. Everybody's got stories. They're all slightly different, some similar. Uh, where the story might have some value in, in just talking about 
my circumstances in this process is simply pointing to different moments, different circumstances, different happenings that occurred in my in this body mind organism called JC that uh, uh, we call awakenings and others who may have similar sorts of experiences uh, can relate to it in that way and that's what we're really pointing to throughout this dialogue is uh, is the awakening process and what it what it means to awaken out of a, a self-centered point of view. Mm -hmm. I think so, the value of stories is that uh, it, it enables people to kind of relate to the notion of becoming awakened because if they, yes. just, if they just look to historical figures like the Buddha or something as examples of awakening, or even yes. contemporary ones like Eckhart Tolle, and they read his awakening story, and they, then they kind of like expect that unless something like that happens to him, to, to them, they right. they are not going to be awakened, and it shows up differently with every person. So, it, yes. so kind of what I'm doing here is presenting a different one every week. You know? Yes, <laughs> and yes. and people get the idea after a while that you know my awakening is going to look like my awakening, not like JC's or Eckhart Tolle's or somebody else. Exactly. You just said what I said, only better. <laughs> oh, okay, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. So, so having said all this, in my case. Um, it starts, well, I can't start my story without saying something about my father. And uh, you can see, uh, already, I, 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 this is an impossible thing for me to talk about without this happening, even now. But um, I grew up, I'll get through it. <laughs> I grew up in the home of an enlightened parent, a very enlightened parent, not just your average guy. And uh, uh, it was something that I just took for granted. And I was the youngest of the siblings. So uh, to be honest, I got the best part of that because, you know, it, it, he, he goes through a process too. So uh, as I was growing up, he was getting older and I was growing up through that. And so I had a chance to sit as a youngster in weekly gatherings that he, had, he led in which he spoke of these things and you know he had a, a following a class we called it class people would come and 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 just hold we had gatherings on a regular basis and uh so i could i not only could be in the presence of this uh growing up but also uh, listen to my father talk about these things as if he was talking directly to me. Everybody used to always say, geez, your dad just seems to be talking to me all the time, you know, wh whoever. Right. And it's just because he was touching truth buttons in them all the time. And, and yet he never had to come to me directly as his son and say, well, son, this, that, and the other thing. He could speak to his children in, you know, in the absence of a of, of father doing it, but in this just enlightened being speaking. And so that was a wonderful thing. And uh, I learned more, I told him later, I learned as much or more from him sometimes by what he did do and say than by what he did do and say. Because he wasn't reactionary. He wasn't uh, voicing opinions. He wasn't, he didn't come at you with anything. He never gave you advice. So uh, he always just, there was always this space where he encouraged you to come forward. And if you went to him with a problem, his first thing was always, well, what part did you play in that? It was never, oh, blaming anybody or that sort of thing. So growing up in that environment uh, meant also that as I, and I grew up as a, any young boy and I was sowing my wild oats and that sort of thing. Um, I, I, I don't want to stay too long on this, but one other little point to make the point regarding my father uh, in high school, for instance, I, I had the car one night and we went out and we were kind of hot riding the car around. And by the time I got home, the car was kind of ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum. <laughs> and uh, I parked it and went to bed. And the next morning he got up and went to use it and he could barely start it. And it was, you know, and this is back in the day of spark plugs and that sort of stuff. And uh, so he had to take it in and spend a few bucks to have it all retuned. He didn't say anything to me about it, except after he did it, he came back and he just asked me, he said, you know, the car was sort of running funny and so forth. Do you know anything about that? Mm -hmm. He didn't blame. He didn't accuse. He didn't penalize. 
And I, <laughs> but I no, I don't, <laughs> I don't, <laughs> I don't know anything about that. But in that wonderful, beautiful way, I knew that he knew. Yeah. And he didn't have to say anything because from then on, I never brought that car home that way again. Mm. As an example, and that's the way he taught. As a parent, that's the way he taught. So now, later, I'm in my twenties, and uh, uh, I. I experience, if you will, my first initial awakening. I got to just say, it reminds me of a Dan Fogelberg song, Leader of the Band. He said, it's about his father, and he says his, his gentle way of sculpting souls took me years to understand. Yes, beautifully put, and that, that would apply to my father. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, I, I don't know how, I, I, my age might have been 25, 60, 70, in that realm of things. Uh, and. Um, this is where the teaching, uh, the, in the, the biblical teaching of Jesus, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. And this is, there am I meaning not Jesus in the midst, but this the Christ consciousness, pure consciousness in the midst. And the in my name part is in the name of pure awareness, in, the, in that mold. So I had a dear friend for two or three years, uh, and we both were, we was after college, and we both were kind of, you know, in no man's land and kind of wondering about, started wondering about life and we started talking about these things. And I never talked about my father's teaching to anybody outside of the class people. And um, so she started inquiring and I started opening up and then she would, she was, oh my goodness. And she wanted to know more. And so we started sharing this sort of thing. And one day we were out on her front porch and, uh, just uh, spending the whole afternoon just kind of whiling away uh, the time and, and rocking in a chair, literally, like two old folks. Uh, and she started pressing me about, why don't you give your life to God? And <laughs> I said, I'm not ready yet. I'm, uh, forgive me, this will go away when I get away from the personal stuff. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not ready yet. And um, I, I still have things I want to do, you know, be my old self kind of thing. And she kept pushing my, that button. She kept repeating, oh, no, no, do it, do it, do it right now. Say it, say it out loud. So I finally, just to get her off my, <laughs> my back, I just said, okay, from this moment on, I give my life to God. And I just barely got those words out of my mouth. And the only way I can, you know, don't, these are metaphorical things. They aren't literal, but it was like, the hand of God came down from the sky and right in my head and lifted me out of the chair and said, well, it's about time. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty cool. And uh, both of us, we, you know, we were in, oh my God, it was just one of those stop time moments. And she saw it or experienced it too. And I, I you know, I became to... Uh, Later, we had a bigger, much, much bigger experience in that same way, and it was it was always with her. And so she was a, uh, were two or three together, together together person for me, mm. and where the, it, it becomes a, uh, I see it now more as you know an energized moment, draw, draws power into those moments and allow. And that's why people who have awakenings generally follow up by seeking out other religious soul or not religious uh spiritual teachers sure and um and that sort of thing because there's a connection there there's energy that passes if you will yeah and and, and that's that that's that's how it started for me nice incidentally i just want to interject here that these yes i, I think it's very beautiful that you become emotional when you think of your father or this this mm. incident and it, it's it um reveals it sort of verifies something which I often say in this show, which is that spiritual awakening doesn't just mean a sort of a, an, emotion, an awakening of consciousness, but it also in, in, yes. involves the blossoming of the heart and other, facult yes. other faculties as well. And um, so there's nothing cold or sterile or you know, bland mm -hmm. about it. It's, it's, it's a very rich, multifaceted sort of uh, development. Passion, love. Yeah, all that stuff, all that good yes. stuff. Yes, well said. Because sometimes it actually is presented in a rather cold light, and you know people kind of brush yes. brush off suffering as as mere illusion and things like that. And um, yes. you know, but you see the greatest exemplars of spiritual awakening not behaving that way at all, having yes. great, great compassion for the world. 
I think that comes a lot from the, 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 the individuals who actually have, and I have this, this comes from my mother, mm -hmm. uh, a tremendous amount of energy. Mm. Uh, I've always been one who I can work 24 hours straight and, and stay attuned to something, mm -hmm. focused on something, etc. Mm. And that's just always been true. That's a born in quality, built in quality. And I remember my father even telling me once that all that energy that's in you someday will will be a valuable thing. <laughs> he could see that. I, I yeah. you know, I was I was just coming to understand it better. That's great. And um, so, having said that, so, uh, these awakenings were they, for me have come in a variety of ways. I came to understand this later as because at, in the doing what I'm doing now. Uh, doing meaning writing and producing and that sort of thing these works that the by having a broad base of experience in these things meaning voice leadings visual leadings light uh, uh, the lack of uh, utter peace the peace of God uh, that sort of thing all these different moments in different circumstances taking place uh, uh, pr future, you know, projections about what do they call it? like not prophecy, but where you you know what's going to happen tomorrow, kind of thing. Uh, so that when I read that uh, that other people are attuned in those ways, I get it. Mm -hmm. In other words, it's not that I'm so highly attuned in all these ways. It's just that I understand. Yes, yeah, I can look at all of that and go yes, 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 yes. I understand. And, and I think that uh, uh, part of that is because of the, uh, that's provided a foundation for the writing now mm. and the producing so that I can, I, can, I, can, I can read stuff and get what they're, you know, I, I, it makes sense to me. Yeah, sure. So, uh, and, and uh, along those lines, then I had the great fortune, you see, of going back to this father of mine uh, in later years. And we, we could talk about it. And he could give me further guidance. So he became my spiritual guide, if you will. And for the last, I don't know, 10 or 12 or so years of his life, we were best friends. And, and we, we spent quite a bit of one-on-one -on -one quiet time together just working through these things. So that was very helpful for me. And to the point that at one point he... he uh, uh, let me come back to that. I, I, I want to bring Krishnamurti into this too, because he's the other fellow who, who has meant the world to me. <laughs> not the world, but the not the world. <laughs> the non-duality fact. Right. Uh, one thing that I, after I experiencing some awakenings, and the you know, awakenings generally, we're speaking of them in terms of they, they, they displace the, the center of me at least momentarily, so that suddenly there's something much bigger going on. And once one happens, and two and three happens, you go, you realize, oh, there's no, there's like much, something much bigger going on. And it's not my mind thinking this stuff. It's, uh, it's not, I'm not, it's not just a higher thought. It's a whole nother reality. And so, and of course, when you get a taste, you get, uh, you, you, if you will, you want more. You, 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 you want to open up more and that sort of thing. And that's where the seeking comes in. So then you start reading books. And I, of course, like so many people, uh, reading a lot of spiritual books. And I would go into libraries and just, uh, or the library, and kind of walk along and almost just wait for a book to jump out at me. And this happened one day with Krishnamurti. I'd never heard of the fellow before. And I, just walking along the library and, and I saw this book and I forgot what the title of it was, but I just pulled it off. I opened it up and I read one page and I, I just dropped my jaw. I said, oh my gosh, this is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. So I took that book home and read it, you know, devoured it and another one and another one. And I just pretty much decided, okay, this guy's, he knows what he's talking about. I don't know. He knows. And I just, I gave it over to him, so to speak. And uh, rather than going through the process of challenging him, you know, like, oh, well, how, what, what does he mean? I just said, okay, he's, he's, he sees into that better than I do, so I'm going to wait for that to show as to what he means by that. And I approached all of his teachings in that way. And then I found out he still was living and he was teaching, you know, giving talks in Ojai, California. Holy smokes. So I flew to Ojai and, and got involved in that, sat through 
two weeks of of uh, living in a tent and just going to those talks and in his presence without going into too many details i mean it, it was magical that's a bad word but uh I, 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 would, I came home once and it was for 10 straight days, there was just absolutely no conflict in my body. It was just absolute peace. And I thought, oh, I hope this just lasts forever and ever. And it didn't. <laughs> it, is, it starts to come back, you know. And, uh, uh, but he had that impact on me. And he could just, he, I, I, he and I sometimes would just look at one another and he just see right through me. And I knew in that second, he knew more about me than I knew about me. And uh, so he, he's the other fellow to just put side by side with my father. Krishna Murti is, uh, I said this often, the purest human being I have ever met in person or in print. And that includes the Buddha and everybody. He's absolute purity in, in, of soul, he was. So I, I felt absolute for, fortunate to have had a chance in the last years of his life to, to be in his presence. So um, now we come back to my father. And he announced toward the end of his life that he was going to have a class. He loved the Bible. That's how he got introduced to it all. He, he was not a churchgoer or anything, but he... he uh, Took a, he was interested in literature, and he was actually majored in lit in college. And he took a class uh, in Bible literature. And that's the first time he'd ever read anything in the Bible in his life. And all of a sudden, he, he just thought there was just so much in those stories that was beyond what was being taught in the class. And so he started, he, he ended up using the Bible as a tool to sort of open him up. And... Uh, uh, so he, he forever referred to the Bible. And he, he, at the end of his life, he decided he was going to give a class, 12 classes we gave, specifically on just the, uh, understanding the, the unfolding of the of consciousness as it shows throughout the Bible. And uh, I, was, I attended, I think, every, every but one but one of those. And I taped them, and I took copious notes. And... Uh, uh, I kind of got in my head that I, I was I uh, that some it was just it came to me that someday I might write this stuff about this stuff. And uh, later, when he was he was had cancer and he was uh, effectively on his deathbed, and we spent the last I'll say six weeks or so pretty much together most of the time. And during that time, I I had started writing this. Thing, this book that, that the book that became the Christ is not a person later on and um, but I it was clear I, even I knew I, I wasn't really capable of writing this book then so I, I decided I would uh, or it came to me that I should I, I should go clear this with him so I took this file with me that I had of stuff and went into his his room and, and uh, I just set it down uh, this day on the, on the side and we were visiting and before I even brought it up, he just uh, he 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 suddenly just changed topic and just said, "Sonny, come over here." <laughs> Not in one of those moments. <laughs> and he, uh, you know, a little closer, look, no, no, come over here. I ended up putting my, <laughs> I'm sorry, it's okay, putting my head on his uh, on his chest right here, and he just started stroking my hair. And he just said, "Put set down the idea of writing a book. It's not ripe yet." You hadn't even told him you were and thinking of writing. I hadn't even told him. Yeah. He knew by uh, by, pick, by awareness. Up on it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. He was given. He was given that that you know, say information, but that he, he was aware of that was going on. And uh, I, I had no, there wasn't even an ounce of resistance in me about that. I just said, "Okay." And I was tearing up then. Mm -hmm. So I took that file back and I put it in a box with all my other stuff, put it up in a shelf, and it sat there for almost 20 years. Wow. So I was uh, then later in life kind of going through a transition again. And the same thing happened. This is where I got introduced to, I hadn't heard of Eckhart Tolle before. And in fact, I hadn't been reading a, a spiritual book for years. And uh, I was in the library and ran across The Power of Now. 
And uh, I just picked it up, started reading it. Oh my gosh, this is, you know, I took it home and devoured that. And that sort of re reignited the book thing. So I, I pulled the stuff off the shelf and started going into it and just spent several years just organizing all the data and putting it together in some chronological order and then just started writing. And, and you, you said it in the first of our interview that the process of writing the book was all part and parcel to the awakening process. Yeah. Because there would come across stuff in my dad's teachings uh, that had, or in notes and other people's teachings about all this in, in Jesus' teachings. And I would go, you know, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see that quite, what, what the, you know, the behind the thing. And, and it would just, because I was in the process at the time, I, I would go to bed at night and that morning I would wake up and it would go, see? Hmm. And I just, oh, oh, yeah. And I'd come running in and I'd write. <laughs> and that whole see process just kept happening throughout the book. And we can talk about this later. However, the, the, the videos have been another step in that regard and have gone off in a different direction so that I can say today, there are some things I would write a little differently in the book if I wrote today that same book. Not a lot, but, but something. Mostly in reference to... Uh, the, there was a witness writing that book. There was an, an, an in-between entity, mentally speaking, who was writing the book, interpreting the stuff. And now, as the end of the videos came... There's no more witness there doing it. It's just writing itself. And we can talk about that more uh, later. That's interesting. Sure. That might be, that's a good time to ask a question that came in related to this point. Um, okay. A fellow named Gordon Howie from Trenton, Michigan asks, when we think we are the doer, is it all beyond our control and in God's control? Is it true that our ego believes to have control, but that in reality our lives are already planned and we just witness the self the set plan unfold? Well, that's actually two or three questions. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> let's see if we can, let's see if we can deal with it. The first part has to do with, uh, read the first part to me again. Oops, hang on a second. I just deleted oh. it. I can get uh -oh. it. I can get it. Um, hang on a second. Great question, by the way. I, I want to yeah. tell um, Hang on, I just I just lost it. Um, okay. Well, I I, I I think I can paraphrase. I, the 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 first part was simply is. It's, uh, it's about thinking that we're the doer. Thinking that we're the doer. You know, yeah. And there and, there are a lot of verses yeah. in the in the Bhagavad Gita about this kind of thing about right. the authorship the of action. Of, uh, yeah, or, yeah so, we think yeah. that we're the doer, but we're not the doer, and so on and so forth. Right. 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 Yeah. Well, that is the. I go over this in my, I'm not trying to promote the videos to anybody, but in the, in yeah, the middle. Yeah, should promote them. They're great videos. <laughs> in, the, in the video, the second episode about the mind, especially mm -hmm. the, uh, the part two, that turned out to be a little longer presentation than I originally intended, but it, to get it in, I just, it just worked out that way, so I split it up into two parts, part one and part two. And part two goes specifically into, if you will, even the science of this fact, that there's no... There's no I entity in the middle of this thing choosing anything. And by the, by the science of it, I mean this, if I can sort of uh, summarize it in a quick form. Um, there, have been, there have been tests done that, you know, where they hook you up, hook up the brain and the different things uh, uh, to see what, what, what's triggering, what's igniting when, and, and the order of events that takes place to see if, if there really is such an entity in the middle who makes a choice about something. And then, the, and then they pose, a, after they're hooking a person up and they, they got a button to push when they think they made the choice about mm -hmm. something, et cetera. And then they measure, well, what, what, what electrical impulse took place in the order of events to see if the person really made a choice or if, the, or if it just happened and then they thought they made a choice. And what they discover in every case that I know of is the impulse to do anything, including push a button or to answer a question or to, you know, anyway, to do anything, occurs first. 
And then, depending on the circumstances, after that impulse, a uh, like a button is pushed to say, oh, I, I, I see the impulse. Yeah. And then, in other words, we're not aware of the impulse when it first occurs, but then yes, it just happens. A few it's seconds just, later, nice we stuff. we we do the thing, and we think that we have chosen to do it. But that's actually, what, yeah, that's what it's like. Usurp the power is what they used to say in the old days, and, and, and uh, you know the the, the the devil and usurping the power thing. Right. Well, the it it doesn't literally usurp power because there's concepts have no power. But the uh, nor does the ego. The ego is just an illusion. It's not powerful. It's just a flat-out illusion that there's a middleman going on here that's choosing things. Yeah, here's and, the question again. Uh, Dan sent it in. He said, "We think we're the doer, um, yes. and it's all be beyond our control. And then we, when we think we are the doer, it, um, is it all beyond our control and in God's control? Is it true that our ego believes to have control, but in the reality, our lives are already planned out and we just witness the set plan unfold? Well, again, that's two different questions. I don't want to go into the planned out part right yeah, now. Let's just, stay with the, let's just stay with the, the, the thought The control process. thing. Yeah. The, the question itself, if Dan can see this, this might help him, and that is that... Um, suggests a duality in itself god as being separate from me mm -hmm. so that there's an i entity here making a choice but then oh no it's god making it the choice if you will or it, the, delivering the impulse affecting me over here and then i do that sort of thing but none of that is true there's because there's no duality there's no god over here and me over here it's just that there's an impulse that takes place in the universe as a whole and it takes place in this case through, let's say, let's say me. And it rises up. And then there's a, a moment of a passage of time. Sometimes they say as long as five seconds. Uh, well, that uh, I, 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 I see the thought, if you will. The thought is there. And then I think, oh, I'm going to do that. And so I uh, start to do it. And I follow on that and say, I decided to do that. And none of that is really true. We didn't decide to do anything. It's just an illusion that you decided to do it. Because in every case, the impulse always occurs first. It never occurs after. Yeah. It never comes five seconds after I choose that I, that I have an impulse to do it. So even if you think, you know, I'm going to make a fourth video and it's going to be all about such and such. And you sit down, you start planning it out and, right. and making plans. What you're saying is that, that if you have a sense that you are, there's a, there's a you which is doing all that and having this great yes. idea, that's, yes. that's a mistaken notion. Yes. That, that really it's just sort of the universe doing it, using the so-called you as an instrument or something. Yes. To, it was put beautifully by another person. Uh, I read recently, and that is, uh, if there's, if there appears to be a choice, then there is no clarity. If in the presence of clarity, there is no choice. So it's all about clarity, hmm. in other words. And what ha what I can say to Dan is, in my case, Dan is actually forwarding the questions. This was actually sent by somebody named uh, Gordon. Okay. Okay. If I oh I I, I see. Um, if in my case, as an example, uh, there was a part of me that still thought I was writing that book. So when and when it comes to little paragraphs in there about free will and choice. I spoke, I said things like, so we have a modicum of free will and therefore we can choose to be, you know, the good part or the lesser part kind of thing. And yet I know now that's not true. Hmm. And the knowing now that's not true happened as, as the, that real, that clarity came. In other words, at some point when I was actually doing the videos and I was working in the same sort of area, free will and choice. And the notion of free will and choice literally dropped away just like that. And in that moment, I went, oh, my gosh, there's nobody here choosing anything. <laughs> and at that at that moment on, I, I, you know, pretty much that that I entity that had been in the middle of this going on 
dropped away and it's just like oh but it happened naturally spontaneously it isn't something i sought or yeah. thought my way through and that's the way it's, that's the only way only legitimate way it comes is is that way let me throw a few things at you um yes. this, this whole topic interests me and uh i have debates with friends about this i'm going to do a whole discussion with adya shanti and susanna marie about this in october uh about the falling away of the sense of a personal self and mm -hmm. um you know and I'm, I'm kind of the control group here because I, I sort of feel like I still have one. Um, <laughs> and if, if, you know, if, if, you well, well. <laughs> yeah, if, if you jab me in the leg with an ice pick or something like that, it's kind of a gruesome yeah. image. But, hey, wow, that really, yeah. there's, uh, there's a me yeah. here who really doesn't like that. Um, yes. and, and there's somebody here who reacts to that. Not, it's not like so, some guy in China all of a sudden cries out in pain, you know. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's sort of a localized experience there that, um, you know, is unpleasant. Um, and so I'll let you, one more thing I'll throw in before I let you respond to that. Um, you know, in the course of speaking in the last few minutes, you've, you've used the word universe, you've acknowledged there is a universe. It could be argued metaphysically that there actually isn't a universe. If you really boil it right down, nothing ever manifested, nothing ever there happened. Isn't, there isn't a universe beyond mind. The mind is what interprets the universe as the universe. So when you talk about what's beyond the mind, then you're also talking about what's beyond the universe. Okay, we're going to have to get into what we mean by mind. Um, but what I would ask is um, if we acknowledge that there's a universe then there's all kinds of things in that universe there's a body for instance that has eyes and nose and senses and and, and whatnot and if there's you know if there's that then why can't there also be subtle components there's a sense of sight there's a sense of hearing there's you know uh, the, 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 they call them the indriyas in Sanskrit, the kind of the subtler aspects of the physical senses. And if there's that, why can't there also be uh, the perceiver, the knower, the jiva, as they call it in Sanskrit, a, a sort of a, a sense of, um, you know, a sort of a personal self. And I, you argue in your, in your video that there's no in reincarnation, at least I believe you argue this, but yes. because t that would imply that there's someone that actually could go from body to body. Uh, which kind of shoots your argument that there is no personal identity. And yet there's abundant evidence about reincarnation, um, all kinds of interesting things, and all the traditional scriptures talk about it. So um, I, you know, in the same breath as saying all this, I could, I could acknowledge and agree that um, ultimately if you take any of these things, universe, body, sense of self, boil them down to their ultimate, cons their ultimate essence, they aren't. They don't exist in any manifest sense. There's just an appearance that they do. But if we, if we, for the sake of practical living, if we acknowledge that appearance, uh, then um, why should one thing not exist, but all these other things still exist in a, in a conditional way? Um, it's called again in Sanskrit. There's a term mitya, which which means dependent reality. And the example is used of a pot where uh, it's really only clay. There is no pot, but clay has sort of taken the apparent shape of a pot and as a pot it serves certain practical functions uh, mm -hmm. but and yet in the same breath there's no pot it's only clay so yes. go ahead <laughs> <laughs> the past is thrown to me <laughs> yeah your, your court <laughs> all right uh, um, I what what helped uh, me understand this in it in all its complexities which you have described it very nicely in all its complexities right mm -hmm. but if one comes to realize that everything every thing every phenomena every phenomenon every movement of life that is seen as a thing, as an object in space and time, from the broad universe on down to you and me as bodies in this universe, is interpreted 100% by mind. I mean, that's the only way the mind perceives it. It, it reveals it as a thing. As an object, that's what the mind does. Capital M, universal mind, or individual yes, mind? Capital M, uni capital M. There's a good point. Okay. Capital M, universal mind. Okay. And uh, because the mind is really not, you know, the brain is. This is another thing that 
I, I came to realize when I in reading all this biological scientific stuff, the brain is not separate from the whole as, as an entity that's doing its own thing, obviously. Nothing. The heart isn't, the lungs aren't, the brain's not. And so, it, you know, the heart beats and you don't, you're not beating, you're not telling the heart to beat and give it the rate and keeping it going. There's no ego in the middle of that. And there's no ego in the middle of breathing. You're just, you're breathing. And you, when you go to sleep, you continue to breathe, etc. There's no ego in the middle of brain work either. The brain is simply a physical manifestation extension of the field. And it, it's, it's like the, the, whole, the same as the body. The body is the gross part of the field. That's what we see. But really all around you right now is a whole bunch of fields of sort of unseen vibratory life going on. That's all part of this whole embodiment we call Rick. And um, uh, so the brain is just, is just expressing based on what happens universally through it. And uh, so when you say, well, there's an, there's an entity somewhere, anywhere, in the first place, there's no entity here now living. That's an illusion of mind. Ever, most, you know, I can't say everybody, can't say most even. But many, the non-dual teachers, many of them, the Krishnamurtis of the world would acknowledge there's, there's just no such thing as an entity. Including the body. Including the body. Yeah, the body is simply a, a living everything. Well, here, the Buddha said it in one line. Life is movement, and movement is life. So what, what is the, the embodiment of Rick today and, and, and JC is this, um, this movement that's just vortexing and spiraling into this little expression at the moment. And when it dies, it goes like that again back in. And so it never, it's, it's here and it's gone. And in, in the movement, life is expressed. And it's expressed through animals. You know, when, when, they, when they feel the pain, they don't identify with it and call it something and go to the doctor and get it fixed. They scream and they run or do what they do because they just because the pain is pelt is felt, excuse me. But they don't they don't say it's my pain. It's just the pain of, of what happens to bodies. And when there's a disassociation with the you know, when there's a, a lack of identification with the pain as being personal, because there's no ego there experiencing it anymore. Then one realize, okay, there can be pain, but it's not my pain. It's just the pain of the universe expressing through this body mind organism right now. I don't know. When, don't when my pain. dog feels pain, he's quite not, not quite so philosophical about it. It's like right. you know, he makes a fuss. Um, you know, right. it, it bothers him. He tries to get that's away just from a it. Natural. That's a spontaneous response to pain. So that. that as they say, well, the, the lack of suffering, when the suffering ends, as the Buddha put it, doesn't mean that pain ends. It means that personal suffering ends. It right. means that I, I don't, don't understand that it's my it. suffering. Right. I don't identify with it. Yeah. And so, and so uh, the same thing for uh, reincarnation, for instance. The identification with this ego that, that one has in this, in this embodiment of the moment thinks it's always oh, going to carry have another life and then another life and then another life that's just the ego's way of fooling you into thinking you're going to, it's going to live forever but the ego is just an illusion in the first place so it's an illusion in the second place and the third place as well if it's an illusion now it's also an illusion in so-called second life yeah so in other words maybe you're saying that uh it's not that there isn't such a thing as reincarnation but the the the, the illusory sense of self uh kind of takes on other bodies until it kind of gets that that you know get, gets that there is no ultimately no individual self and then as the traditions say you, you stop reincarnating when you get that no no i would not say there's any reincarnation well you're I, you're kind I, of I, flying in the face of all of hinduism and buddhism there well no no yes but i uh well a lot of things we all say are flying in the face of a lot of things you know, <laughs> right and, yeah. and remember all the scripture. Look at look at all the stuff that's in the Bible. That's that's has nothing to do with anything really, and it's ancient. And so, just because it was written two thousand years ago, doesn't make it uh, somehow more insightful than what than what somebody says today or what somebody 
uh, understands or witnesses today, you know. Yeah, so, although it has stood the test of time, which may or may not be a, a good thing. Sure, but, but it's all kind of, remember it's it's just it's language, and it's most everything that was written was not written by Jesus. Never wrote a gospel according to Jesus. No, the Buddha never wrote anything. You know, the things that were written are by the the. If I, if I call it, but lesser lights, you know, later on, oftentimes decades later, etc. So they're not they're not really presenting the teaching as Jesus presented the teaching. They're presenting it as they understand it. And so their understanding is not up to par, to be blunt about it. And so that's why a lot of that stuff keeps flow, keeps going. Now, let me let's not let's forget about what they said. Let's look at it now. In other words, you this is an understanding that you can come to now. You don't have to rely on anybody else to understand this. Uh, uh, and in fact, that's that's a requirement. You can't. There's nothing that's ever written by somebody else that can mean anything until it com is realized in you. So that's what we're going for: is not to try and justify what somebody else wrote, but to understand it ourselves. And I, and I, I am in this interview. We're not going into this for the rest of the interview. So I'm just flat out saying. <laughs> There's no such thing as reincarnation simply because there's no such thing as any separate entity anywhere in the universe that exists, period. And that everything that we, we, we come, whether it's a concept about uh, reincarnation, concept about future life, a concept about, it's all concept, a concept about, you name it, every concept, no matter how subtle or sublime, which I say numerous times throughout the videos, no matter how subtle or how sublime or how beautiful and how uplifting and inspirational and you name it, it's all concept. All of it is. So what happens when we awaken, I mean, when a genuine, we awaken and then the, and it, and it get in the, you know, the ego business drops away, is that there's a, real, there's a clarity, there's a realization that all phenomena is concept. So what we're talking about or pointing to is what is beyond concept. We're not trying to explain one concept versus another concept or trying to say this concept is correct and that concept is not correct. We're saying all concept is illusion of mind. Right, In not, yeah. including us. So there's no J.C. Teff, there's no Rick Archer. Well, there, there Those there are just a, concepts that are illusions of mind. The concepts that we... The, the the naming of the thing. In other words, there's a there's a. Uh, well, whatever the it's name. Like you, I, it's like you, I say. You know, remember reading one guy, and he, he was talking about uh, as if when you turned around. Uh, I, I was in my uh, family room downstairs, and I was uh, standing in front of the fireplace, and I had read this guy, and he was talking about well, if you turn around and. That it's like the fireplace isn't there anymore because you're not conscious of it. But of course, I know the fireplace is there, even when I'm turned around mm -hmm. and somebody else looks at it and they see the fireplace. So the fireplace is there. It's just the interpretation of mind in, in, in this conscious expression moment is either I'm, it's in the mind, it's in visual view, it's perceived right now, or it's not perceived right now. If it's not perceived right now, then it's still a concept in my mind. I see it, you know, as an image in my mind. So all of that, if we weren't, you know, a lot of times uh, people will say when, when, they're, when they've had this, what I call sometimes grand mall awakening, a la <laughs> Eckhart Tolle or something, why it's just like the, the whole world is obliterated because awareness is what is aware of these phenomena and it's awareness that is changeless and formless and eternal, not the phenomena. All phenomena comes and goes, changes. You know, you, you live, you die. It all is just the living movement of life. And uh, that's the Buddhist teaching. Life, uh, uh, life is movement and movement is life. If it's not in movement, it's not life. So if it's just pure awareness, it's, it's not life, it's just awareness of the movement of life. Right. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it goes back to when I got that picture of the, uh, the mind is all phenomena and that which is other than mind is non-duality or non-phenomena, then what we're pointing to is here's the phenomena over here, mind, and here's the non-phenomena over here, not mind, 
beyond mind, other than mind, as Krishnamurti used to call it a lot. And the awakening occurs when this mind stuff falls away and one realizes that the other than mind is what is the truth, the reality, and whatever appears and disappears in mind is the changing for me, you know, stuff that just comes and goes all the time. Yeah, no, I'm good with that. Um, and obviously, again, there are all sorts of traditional expressions of that in the Upanishads, which you quote quite yes. a bit, um, yes. and so on. Um, the point I was trying to hit on, which I don't think I've quite, we've quite resolved, is that um, if we regard the universe as, a, as an expression of mind or as a concept in mind, co cosmic mind, we're saying, uh, we're acknowledging that there is, you know, that we're acknowledging that at least provisionally, conditionally, there is a universe. It's, you know, ultimately perhaps not, not there, but uh, conditionally, provisionally, as, a, as an expression or a manifestation of, of cosmic mind, then that doesn't put any limits on, on what phenomena in the universe can contain. If it contains gross physical bodies, then it can contain subtle bodies, and subtle bodies can transmigrate. Um, and, you know, if it contains, you know, flesh and blood life forms, it can contain subtle life forms such as, you know, angels and devas and all that stuff, subtle realms. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, ultimately they can all be boiled down to the absolute, you know, oneness. And we can argue that they, they don't exist because everything is ultimately nothing other than that. But, yes. um, but in a conditional sense, uh, we can accept them as, um, you know, changing phenomenon, which are part of the, the whole cosmic play. Yes, um, the, the, uh, the only thing I would add to that is that it doesn't really make a difference, does it, with uh, when you talk about the, the, the more the physical plane or something, and then, the, then there's other dimensions or the subtler, and, mm -hmm. the, and we get more and more refined, and as you say, it is all mm -hmm. part of the universe, yes. But there's some, uh, the, the problem with it is there's some sort of a differentiation to say that, well, uh, so this is somehow more of a refined concept or, or purer way of seeing things. The subtler the concept, the more pure is the, is the insight. And I would say uh, it's all mind. In other words, there's no such thing as a purer in concept versus a less pure concept or... Uh, the the it's still uh, the you know the dimension as interpreted by mind the afterlife as interpreted by mind is still in the realm of concept and those those realms are not pointing to pure consciousness they're just pointing to other realms other concepts so uh, and and that and the problem with the the religions that have come out of these things is that they 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 point to that and say, well, here's what you know. You, you, should, you should desire or something to become this subtle being uh, in another realm because that's what you so sort of do these whatever you do here to become that, and all that is just more becoming, more becoming, more becoming, all operative in the in the realm of concepts of mind. Oh, I agree. It's I mean, you can do that. You, you know, yes. if you if you want, you can be, or not, or if you if you set it up that way, you'll end up being reborn in some subtle realm and live there for a long time, and then you come back or whatever. But that doesn't mean you've grasped the ultimate reality, or that that's ultimately what you should shoot for. Is you know, well, I wouldn't say I wouldn't use those words. I you can do that. You can't. Yeah, do yeah. Anything. I know. I, you know, I know. <laughs> I, I, I'm getting picky here, but it's, see, there's not a. It There's can happen. A, you, you, what it is, is uh, I had a wonderful, uh, uh, someone wrote me a couple of days ago um, about the videos. Uh, she, she had watched the, the, the last one that was recently posted. And she said, in, in, in watching the video, she said, I, I, I'm a paraphrasing, so I'm, but I, I, some things that I thought, I believed I was, you know, kind of awakened or, you know, whatever, they started dropping away and, and, I began to see that all those little subtle things that I, you know, it was still attached to, uh, are just more attachments to mental constructs of mind. So that uh, the sooner one realizes that it's all mind, the sooner one drops. The, the sooner the egoic tendency to uh, to identify with 
any aspect of mine drops away. So then there's no more argument about, well, this is something I can, yeah, I'm going to become something, you know, in life, another life, or all those things are just, well, if you want to believe that, go ahead, but it doesn't have anything to do with what we're talking about here, see? I think you can acknowledge the, you know, all sorts of mechanics of the universe, subtle and gross, without identifying with it. You know, you can acknowledge that maybe it works the way we've been alluding to, you know, with other realms and other lives and all that stuff, but it doesn't mean you necessarily uh, identify with that or are caught up in the illusion of it. It just yeah. means that, you know, there's a story about Shankara. I've told this before, but uh, you know who Shankara was. Most people do. He was the one, pretty much the founder of non-duality. And he went to visit some king one time, and the king wanted to put him to the test. So as Shankara was approaching the palace, the king let loose a wild elephant. And the elephant came running towards Shankara, and he scampered up a tree to escape the elephant. And the king said, aha, you failed the test. You know, if, if everything's an illusion, why did you bother climbing the tree? And Shankar said, well, the illusory elephant chased the illusory me up the illusory tree. So if we're going to function in the world, and, and yeah. obviously even if to make a statement like that, there's all sorts of you know, words that can trip you up like we and function and world. You know, you can uh, kind of cut to the, to the heart of all we, those. We can't, we can't avoid the words because that's right, how we... Right, and yeah. we can't avoid the, the, what those words represent if we're to live as human beings. Uh, then, uh, you know, we're in a sense, we're, we're kind of making a concession with, with Maya, you know, with, with yeah. and, and this is referred to as Lesha Vidya in the, in the, uh, the um, Vedantic uh, uh, lore, which means faint remains of ignorance. There's a sort of a, yeah. a, a sort of concession with the faint remains of the unreal in order yeah. to actually have a functioning existence in, in some so sense. Well, if you, uh, if you, Note in the, in the uh, in the video, uh, the last one, where it talks about even after a substantial awakening, Jesus being driven into the wilderness by the Spirit, mm -hmm. and so forth, there's still things that need to be worked out in him. Yeah, it's not like it all goes whap and done. Uh, I, I remember reading about Eckhart Tolle, for instance, where he had this grand experience, awakening, but uh, it was he was five years after that you know, exploring what, and dealing with, with what just happened and so forth. And there's a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. It doesn't just all disappear in an, in an instant. So you're right. There's, there's, a, there's in the field, there's, there's stuff that's I mean, it's been here for thousands of years, you know, it still mm -hmm. has some strength in it. Yeah. And the Buddha and, uh, continues uh, to meditate all his life, you know? Yes. So, so, so it's, uh, and you, we, oh, go, ahead, go ahead. That's unfair, unfair of me to ask because I, 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 I I'm sure Adi Ashanti would, be ch chagrined to have someone else say what what he say. but how do you know how does Adi Ashanti see this? Uh, I can't quite answer yet. You'll have to wait till October. Um, okay. There's a whole course he gave on the falling away of the of the of the sense of personal self, and I'm only yes. part way into it, and I, I'm really going to study it and uh, listen to it thoroughly before October. Uh, so you'll have to just stay tuned. Will you get back with me on that? I'm yeah. interested. <laughs> I will. Um, that's going to be ta uh, videoed sometime? It will be. In uh, late October, it'll be up on that gap. Um, I, here's a question that came in that I think pertains to everything we're saying. Uh, I have to lean over slightly to read it because there's a camera in front of my screen. Uh, this is from Dan in London. Uh, following on the previous question asked by Gordon regarding who is really the doer, interesting point about the impulse uh, occurs first, which I completely understand. I know science has proven this in that instruments can see that neurons fire before the thought to do the action arises. However, is it not, uh, is it also not a form of yoga to avoid acting on impulses? I think there is actually more, th this is actually more complex than this. The fact that neurons fire before the thought uh, before thoughts does not really prove anything because impulses can also be avoided and one can be mindful of thoughts. So we're talking about discrimination here. Um, mm -hmm. I do think that we have no choice regarding the actions we perform and I have intuition that I am not the doer, but I don't think that this actually proves that point. What are your thoughts on this? Apologies if this sounds argumentative. Um, uh, per perhaps I've misunderstood your point. No, 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 no. That's a very good question. And I, I, I'm actually going to uh, respond to it very much in the moment because I haven't really myself uh, given much attention to this, what he brings up. And I think what he brings up is very, very valid and very important. And that is that 
Yeah, you know how most of us, uh, through much of our life, the, the mind is just ticking. People say all the time, well, how can I stop my thoughts? You know, or they, mm -hmm. it just can't, your mind is just active. It's just vibrant and doing this all the time, especially in today's world with all the stimuli stuff. Oh my gosh, yes. So um, uh, uh, there's much of that goes on even in those circumstances when it's not really acted upon i mean it's still showed up but it or an impulse a thought arose or a, even a, an emotion or a, uh, some sort of thing arose and it wasn't necessarily acted upon and so as i'm seeing it now it was the as uh, the question was posed that the difference is there's a tendency in and uh, forgive me for putting it this way, but in, in a non-awakened environment to, to, to flit all over the place with, as things arise and identify with this, not identify with that, you know, resistance, push, take, conflict, all the different stuff that goes on that creates this, this circumstance which isn't, which isn't in, the, in the peace, in the calm, in the stillness. Whereas when that, when that stuff is not active like that anymore, then um, there's, a, there's another thing that happens in the stillness, which is a movement. A, a kind, uh, it's, it's less about an impulse and more about just a, a push. It's kind of like pushing you over the edge and saying, this is something that needs to be moved upon. Mm -hmm. And you do because, you, because you're moved to do so. And there are other things you look at and you go, well, I, I don't have any reaction to that. I, you know, even though the thought is there, there's just no reaction to it. So the more that comes into play, that, that, that process, then it's not about, uh, you know, the impulse is there, but the calmer, the stiller, the, the less and less reaction to the point there's barely any reaction at all. And the only movement that takes place, and we'll call it an enlightened beingness, is the actual movement to do so and that's something that's a little more powerful than just a thought arising if if, if you know what i mean so yeah. that so that uh so that when i i forgot how he put it but the questioner said something like um you know we we, we don't respond to things and don't react so what's that that's like a choice or that's like a you know to the, versus the impulse etc it's it's more i guess what the power of it is yeah, and if there's a lot of power behind it somehow, and the, and the freer you are from identifying with more, it's just it's just the natural spontaneity of the moment. That's the universe living itself through you, or as an expression of you. Yeah, good point. I mean, we're talking about you know being the doer or not being the doer. If you're not the doer, then who's the doer? The doer is cosmic intelligence, if you want to put yes. it that way. Yes. And, and cosmic, well. cosmic intelligence is not bound by conditioning the way bound individual yes. in, intelligence is. And yes. it, it, can, it can respond much more appropriately and uh, evolutionarily, if that's a word. It responds so, in the way that the cosmic intelligence wants to respond, if you want to put it that way. Right. Sort of. Yes. Uh, the, the, the closer one is to, to just being in the moment, the more one is just living life in the now as it expresses. Yeah. And so, uh, and life expresses, continues to express. It doesn't stop expressing, it continues to express. So that's why, uh, to use Jesus, and I, 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 anyway, uh, it's hard to use Jesus because his teachings have been so obliterated. But I've also kind of realized that one of the reasons I like to use him is to, to re- invigorate some of those teachings to see that there, there's more to that than what people understand. So anyway, uh, uh, that comes from my father. Uh, the, the, uh, he was moved at some point to go to Jerusalem. And, and he actually knew ahead of time. Jesus that he was. was. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. to walk into his death. Right. And he spoke of it. Mm -hmm. And he knew exactly. I mean, by knew, there was a knowing in him that somehow the universe wanted this to happen, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so... He moved accordingly. Yeah. Now, if the, the ego of Jesus would definitely have said, I don't think I want to. <laughs> well, I'm not so sure about this, you know, right? I mean, because well, the ego. It sort of did that in, in the Garden of Gethsemane momentarily. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. That is, that's a wonderful story where he, you know, he, he, there's a wrestling with that a little bit. Like, yeah. gee whiz, really? You know, do I? But after he comes out the third time or something, it's okay, all is well, and it's okay. Yeah. Because 
because he it got dealt with. And from that moment on, he was clear minded on the in the issue. And another example of awakening is an ongoing process, you know. Yeah. Um, okay, I think we kind of covered that. Just one one uh, analogy to throw in here, just for for the heck of it. Um, if we sort of think of thoughts as being like a river, which start out as a little trickle and then gain momentum as they move towards the ocean, um, yeah. and if we think of uh, you know, self-realization as being kind of established at the source of that little of that river, kind of at the like Gangotri, for instance, at the source of the Ganges. Um, yeah. Then, if we can kind of, if we're there, we can perceive the thought as it emerges, and it might be easy to redirect it in some way or to send it off or to, to whatever. Whereas, if we're way down in uh, Calcutta, you know, by the time the Ganges has gotten huge and massive and it's too late to change the direction of course of the river. It's just like it has its force. So um, like that, if, if you're not anywhere near established in, in the self, uh, then, you know, you're kind of way out at the, you know, externally uh, oriented and yes. you're at the mercy of thoughts and, and impulses that arise. There's, there's very little, very, yes. very little discrimination or ability to sort of act, as we were saying, in accordance with cosmic mind. The, the individual conditioning runs the show. Well, that would be a good uh, sort of definition, if you will, of ancient religion. And take Christianity or any other religions, but Christianity is the one that typically we're most familiar with here. And that is, um, you know, they, 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 they develop this whole thought, doctrinal mind process of what, it's, what the teaching was about. And then they... Uh, put it out into the public view and and really get to the point of enforcing it yeah and 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 then making you belong to it and tithe to it and and in fact you can't get dispensa dispensation unless you go meet the judge at the at the in the church thing and for a thousand years they didn't allow anybody to see the Latin Vulgate Bible and uh, so and nobody could ever even knew what was in the Bible they just knew what this guy at the up in the podium was telling them and then then the bible gets published in different languages and then some people start reading it well this doesn't quite what i what they're saying in the church it's a little different so long story short you know but these things are like that river you're talking about by the time you get downstream of that of the, that conceptual barrage of stuff there's great great power in in those things and they they have a life of their own after a while and they're already in the human psyche before you're born now. So you have to almost come out of that morass uh, to, and not, you know, it, it's much more difficult to identify with it when you're young than to not identify with it in the first place. I, I think there was something, and maybe I'm wrong, There was, uh, this might be something my father said, but it seems like there was something in the, in the Bible that said, uh, that the Jesus had the children for a for a period of time, if they could be in, in the presence of that guy, for instance, that uh, in one generation, I think probably my dad said this, in one generation, uh, there would be a whole new take on things because they wouldn't be gotten a hold of by cultural stuff. Yeah. You know? Yeah, they're, they're, cultural conditioning. So those those are the things that are very powerful in our in all of our fields. When uh, right away are those downstream things, as you put it so well. Yeah. And that the less we're attached to that downstream stuff, the the better chance there can be for awakenings. Freedom and flexibility. Yeah. I mean, I was talking about of it in terms of individual conditioning. You you kind of put it in terms of societal conditioning, but I think it's the yes. same same dynamics. It's all it's all. It's all the same whether you, yeah, whether you put yeah. it into a person or put it into society. It's all conditioning. Yeah. Let's ask another question that came in here. Um, this is Gloria from Asheboro, North Carolina. Um, words are important. In listening and reading some of your thoughts, I noticed that there are times when you use mind and consciousness interchangeably. 
Personally, I experience these two terms as very separate. I use the term mind as the experiences, beliefs, opinions, cultural conditionings, etc. I have downloaded over my 79 years, including my world identity, <laughs> ego. Consciousness is my awareness of the outside world and awareness of my inside world. Only my conscious awareness can reprogram my mind. I, I would appreciate your thoughts. Um, she, she has a, a, a valid point, I guess, uh, in that, and I, and I and forgive me if I did, if I've used it in such a way to, to make it seem as one and the same, because it's like consciousness is awareness. Uh, in my videos, you know, I, I use uh, David Bohm's uh, wonderful implicit theory. and explicit order yeah yes implicate and explicate and the explicate is the expression the actual phenomena the expression mm -hmm. and the implicate is the source out of which it arises and so in the explicate everything that's viewed out there perceived and conceived could be called in be in the realm of consciousness but awareness or the source is not consciousness because uh, uh, awareness is is that which witnesses consciousness, if, if you will. Yeah, uh, you know, and it's terminology here. I mean, because other yeah. people might use the word consciousness the way you're using the word awareness. So we're just trying to yeah. get, get your so, your particular so use mind, of the terms clarified. My, and the mind part, the mind consciousness part. I, I I see mind as as that which interprets the explicate it, it interprets it conceptually it, it uh, literally kind of changes it into a concept and the human mind names it and says oh that is this that's the distinction between basically the animal and the and the human uh, experience is the human names it and then says this is what it is and really makes a real concept out of it and and it becomes a thing hmm. in and of itself Whereas the animal, more or less, just experiences it and then it's gone. And uh, so they don't identify with it. And in that sense, the animal is sort of closer to, to just spontaneity than, than most humans are. So mind is the interpreter, if you will. It's what delivers the concept in its form that it is. And consciousness as a whole includes uh, a ho the whole, whatever the, all the vagaries might be in the explicate order of things. I guess that's how I would say it. Okay, I hope that helps. Uh, here, I might as well throw another question here and then we'll, we'll kind of move on. Um, this is Prithivi from Boston. She says, hi JC, you mentioned that Krishnamurti had a deep influence on you. How would you summarize your seeing of his core teaching that there is no observer? How does the illusion of the observer come into being? I guess we already discussed the first part, but how, this, this part we haven't. How does the illusion yes. of the observer come into being in the first place? How is it related to thoughts and the origin of thoughts? Well, um, I'm not sure I can say how, uh, other than uh, the best example I can give is one that I gave in the videos where you, uh, you, know, you have the baby, the, 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 the newborn child, and when they look out, when, when the newborn child looks out onto the world, they aren't naming it then. Uh, they're just proceeding, and they're just uh, so they s hear sounds and they don't have a name for it. They just they just respond to it, you know, to it based on how it sits favorably with their perception, or they see things and all that kind of stuff. Um, so uh, that's pure perception going on. But then, as they mature. The, the society, parents and so forth, as well as the child just inbuilt, the, you know, starts to develop this mind which begins to see things conceptually, name them, and then decide whether it's good, bad, and different, and, you know, labeling them and, and, and going into all that process. So that just, that just happens naturally as a part of the human experience of living. And, and uh, what comes out the other end if if it does at all is realizing that that whole identification process is not useful because it begins to we start believing that that those concepts we hold are us are me i i i think i'm 
you know, I'm this kind of person, I am capable of these kind of things, but I'm not capable of those kind of things. People like me, people don't like, you know, all the stuff. And mm -hmm. that becomes who we think we are. And it's those attachments that are the illusion. And when the illusion drops, we realize we aren't those thoughts, those concepts. But that doesn't mean that thoughts and concepts don't continue to arise. It simply means they arise, but we, don't, we know that that's not us or me. That's just a thought arising. Yeah, which kind of, there's a fine point here, which is it's not that concepts and thoughts aren't useful. It's just that the identification with them isn't so good. Yes. You know, because what, you got to know this is my bicycle and this is my mother and this is my, yes. this is my spinach or whatever. Yes. <laughs> but, for uh, daily living, for yeah. daily living, concepts it's, are useful. Yeah. It's, 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 yeah, it's, 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 it's becoming so attached to them that I not only, you know, think I'm that, but I want everybody else to be that too. I want them to sign up with my, with my program. I want them to think how I think, I want them to, you know, da-da-da-da-da, and that's how we get all this social conflict going on all the time. Yeah, it's interesting. I've, I've interviewed some people who clearly remember that as a child they were basically in a state of unity, you know, just a, a, yes. a really enlightened kind of state, and that at a certain age they could feel that beginning to be lost, and it was quite, yes. quite painful, and then they, maybe they went through their teenage years, and then maybe in late teens, early 20s, the, the kind of the light went on again and they, they realized, whoa, I, I got to get back to this. And they started doing yoga or whatever and, and uh, you know, kind of began to regain it. But most people don't have that, aren't that clear and go through their whole lives in a state of confusion. Right. But, but there are some blessed souls who, who come in in a, in a very clear state due, I'm, to, due to the reincarnation. I'm one of those not so blessed <laughs> souls, if you will. Oh, me I neither, man. I don't remember much of anything but, you know, earlier yeah. than five or six years old. Yeah. Um, all right, so we've been going on about this and that uh, somewhat randomly, taking questions and all, um, but we have your whole body of work that we haven't really addressed in a systematic way, and, and obviously we won't have hours and hours to do that, but um, perhaps um, you would like to give people an overview of what's in your book and what's in your videos, and maybe we'll have some little bits of discussion around some of the points that you, you bring up. Okay, well, in general, I can, I can talk about those two broad projects in, in broad terms, mm -hmm. uh, actually. Um, I guess I'll reiterate that the, I was, the, the book itself, I, I commonly say it's five years in the, in the writing process, mm -hmm. in the making. It wasn't literally five years because I only worked on it for six months in the winter each year. So mm -hmm. it's five, six month periods, mm -hmm. basically. Uh, but it w those were very intense and, and very... Um, because I was dealing with a lot of material. And the whole motivation behind it started from my, with my father's, uh, those lessons that he gave, uh, uh, that I talked about earlier, about those 12 lessons that just, just he kind of walked through the Bible and he, with, with the theme of uh, growing conscious awareness in, through it and just kind of weaved a thread through the whole thing, skipping all the stuff that doesn't make any difference and just pointing out, the, highlighting the, the, the milestones, if you will. So that's what the book does. And the, the added thing in the book, however, and, I, and this became a, a early on a, a, a realization that this was important to do it this way, because I had no interest in, in promoting Christianity or the Bible as the book of truth versus anything else. And in fact, I was very aware that's not true. So uh, I, 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 I spent a lot of time reading those uh, the Bhagavad Gita and those other things, but just typing myriads of notes and quotes from those things. Mm -hmm. And therefore, as I worked through the Bible, which is the focus of the book, I kept interjecting these other things to say it's all pointing to the same thing. Uh, and so that you can see in, in, the, in certain Hindu works, you can see in certain uh, Buddhist teachings, uh, you can see in certain, you know, other teachings that uh, uh, they're all, they're just using a little different language. It grew up in a different culture, but they're all pointing to the same thing. So I wanted it to be a very inclusive work. And, and it's proven true because I have had that feedback from people how they, they were, they were, one of the things they loved about the book is, is the inclusiveness of it and how it showed that there, it's, it's, it's all one teaching. It's just said in different ways or pointed to in different ways. But fundamentally, on the profound level of things, it's all one teaching 
arising out of different cultures around mm -hmm. the world. The perennial philosophy. Yes. So, so that's the, the book, however, stayed focused on ancient teachings. Uh, it's almost exclusively, it, it doesn't deal with modern science, physics, any of that stuff. So when I was done with the book, uh, that you know that was the overall, and also to uh, I should say to to peel back the layers of, of uh, uh, doctrinal kinds of things on, on Jesus's teachings, for instance, and to show that well, you know, there's there's not it, this, all this Son of God stuff and whatever is not what he was talking about at all. He's pointing to these very same things that the Buddha was pointing to. He was just doing it in a Western culture, which is a little harder take at the time. And, uh, and he had stiffer things to deal with. So, as he said, I, I, I can't, uh, one of the quotes, the telling quotes of the whole thing is, I, I, I speak to them in parables because them, they hearing do not hear and they seeing do not see and they do not understand. In other words, he couldn't just speak openly to the, to the masses, if you will, because there wasn't a, a, a ready public audience to to hear what he really had to say so a lot of the language gets you know this this just gets clouded a little bit so i wanted to to show jesus teachings in a different light that was another factor as well as some of the prophets and the other book that i just love and i refer to it all through commonly and you may have noticed is the the genesis the, the creation story because the creation story is so beautifully written with all this metaphorical reference to the 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 flowering of pure of of simple you know of uh, uh, conceptual consciousness first, and then the possibility of something larger than that later the the tree of life the tree of knowledge thing, and uh, and so I, I I constantly refer to that because I just think it's a wonderful thing that was written back then in the language of its time to kind of point that out the, uh, the the growing unfolding of something new that was coming a new dispensation and the guys like jesus were the examples of that dispensation at the end yeah there's something you say actually in uh in your videos and here and there about a sort of a dawning of uh, a new dawning of awareness in humankind yes. that that and that jesus and buddha and some of these were kind of like the pioneers but that well, now yes, it's now it's yeah you know, the forerunners but now that it's really it's really beginning yeah. to flower right. um wanna, maybe we could talk about that a little bit too well you and i are here talking about that right yeah and you have an audience that's viewing it and and we and and you, then you have the Eckhart Tolle's of the world and the krishnamurti's of the world and the adi ashanti's of the world and on and on and on and there's thousands of people viewing in who have a who have an under uh, understanding of this too right and uh, which and, was not and, the case 2000 years ago probably oh, yeah no i mean you couldn't find probably in his uh, no doubt in his lifetime jesus found no one who he could talk to openly mm. including his disciples he you know his disciples didn't really understand they just sort of got a little bit of it and um uh, tr truthfully, the one guy who understood best was Paul, the Apostle Paul. But the Apostle Paul was not a disciple. He was just a guy who, who had a knockdown, drag out, awakening moment when he began, he saw, oh my gosh, this guy isn't who they say he is. You know, uh, he's not the devil incarnate. He's actually a, <laughs> he's actually a pretty wise guy. I mean, you know, I'm, we're just yeah, yeah. stupid language, but that's. Right. Whatever and, wise and guy is in Aramaic, on, that's what he was yes. saying. <laughs> from that moment on, he was he himself was a completely different fellow, and he went he went off into the wilderness for actually a lot of thirteen years or so, and and then he came back after a lot of things sort of worked itself out in him, and then he went out and said, you know, he's the one who really was the, the important person who spread the because he really understood it in himself in ways that others didn't. But that's like one other guy. Interesting that he got zapped like that. You know, I mean, he was yes. kind of, he was sort of an anti-Jesus guy, and uh, you know, he was just going along on the road to yes. Damascus and, and got zapped. It, it, it's sort of um, you wonder about the 
Well, there's the universe just just yeah uh, yeah and also uh, it's interesting i could uh, quietly say i guess i've had a, a big affinity with paul uh, mm -hmm. most of my life for some reason and, and I always picture him almost just about my size <laughs> for the whole thing. Cute little but black mostly, hat on. Mostly, <laughs> mostly because he he uh, of his energy. Uh -huh. He was a he was a you know dynamic guy. guy. Dynamic yeah. guy. He was out there you know doing for the troops and marching along, and so that energy made him a good candidate for that zap down that he experienced. Yeah. Uh, if he was just a you know laid back sort of guy where you're not that was not likely going to happen so it's kind of like the lightning bolt comes to where the the you know the attraction is and and that's that's to me explains his that dynamite moment that happened yeah and just to, to throw a little bit of woo in here to, to keep it interesting um you know i i believe that the the universe is it's not just some amorphous field of intelligence and okay now it zaps paul uh, you know, uh, there, there are hierarchies and agencies and impulses of intelligence governing everything. Um, and there, there are those who, who perceive these things. But the whole notion of, you know, angels or, you know, various beings working on various levels of creation, doing various things. I don't, personally, I don't have a problem with that whatsoever and, and, or, in, or in reconciling that with, with non-duality. Um, it's just sort of the part of the... The, in, the beauty and the mystery and the intricacy with which the creation functions. And the reason I bring it up is that, you know, thinking of somebody like Paul, there was, there was some intelligence or agents, intelligent agents who recognized in Paul the capacity to do what he was destined to do and who were responsible for, you know, you know awakening in him that, uh, that experience, which led him to go on and do what he ended up doing. Um, so I'm just kind of like bugging you a little bit, going back to our previous debate about <laughs> yeah, yeah. about subtle realms and reincarnation and all that jazz. It's like there's no conflict between you know regarding the mechanics of the universe in that way and regarding it all <laughs> a, as ultimately pure one non-dual you know mass of, of Brahman. Well, uh, I want to woo back at you here. Okay. There's 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 one. I, I see your woo and raise you two woos. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> well, let me get my woo out first. <laughs> you raise me. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, you see, the the flaw in what you just presented. And I'm, forgive me for. No, it's okay. It's a friendly debate. Being, being direct about it. That's good. It, so direct about it is because uh, um, I'm not arguing with you. I'm just trying to point out. Yeah. That. If there's no entity now, it's an illusion of mind, then there's no entity in all these other things that you describe about. And when, when you say there are all these subtle beings or whatever, yeah. make decisions or doing this, they aren't making decisions then and they aren't, you aren't making a decision now. You just falsely think you are. I'm not pointing the finger at you. I'm just saying we. And, uh, and so it, it, the, the truth of here now applies to this other realms mm -hmm. that you talk about. Yeah. So the one thing that that clarity brings is there in a simple statement. There is no such thing as a separate entity anywhere in the universe, not in any realm, not in this world, not in the mind. There's no such thing as a separate entity. Mm -hmm. It's all an illusion of mind. So therefore, everything that arises in the universe arises out of one source, which we call God, typically, and the ancients did. We now, we, we refer to it a lot as consciousness, because it arises in consciousness. And uh, the source is the one and only source, not multiple sources. And so, and there's not multiple entities out here making decisions about that source arising or deciding to help this and to do that. And there's no doing going on in that other realm any more than there's doing going on in this realm. It's all an illusion of mind. So you can take what you said and, and make it viable by saying that all those expressions, whether they be in subtle realms or you know this, that, and the other thing, all arise out of one source and they're all a movement of life 
and there's no individual entity anywhere that's moving life around in some cat, you know, some pre independent of the whole, uh, right? Independent of the whole, right? That, no, I totally agree with that. I agree with everything yeah. you just said. My finger yes. is not independent of my body. My eye is not independent of my body. My ear yes. is not independent of my body. All yes. these are functions, or yes. they're, they're my sense, they're my organs of perception and action, right? Yes. So we, you and well, I, they aren't even yours, really. Right, 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 right. But yes. they're, they're the organs of perception and action of this yes. mind-body yes. mechanism. So right. same with all beings, animals, yes. people, yes. angels, whatever there may be. Yes. They're just sense organs of the infinite. Yes. Organs of action of the infinite. They, yes. They don't, they don't have any sort of uh, autonomous existence independent of the infinite. They're all just expressing infinite divine intelligence through yes. their particular instrumentation in, one in their own yeah. living movement of life. One giant whole, vast wholeness of yes. consciousness. Yes. Yes. And that, yes, <laughs> that, that's how I would say it. And, Good. And that's that, how I would say it that, too. That's how I just said it. And, and, <laughs> yes. And <laughs> that, going back to that, that, that earlier, um, uh, thing I mentioned, my, my the first awakening that occurred in me, where the hand of God coming down and the voice saying, uh, "It's about time." That's not an entity out there coming down and you know attaching to this entity down here and you know giving me a word of a pat on the back or something of that sort. That's just the universe expressing holistically. In, in a matter of the movement of life as based on the current energy and vibrations and vortexes of things going on in that moment at that time. I agree with you, but I, I, but coming back at that, I could also say that, you know, the, the instrument of, of, you know, the divine, uh, sent the sense organ of the infinite, namely, J.C. Teft's guardian angel, let's say, if there is such a thing, or, you know, uh, kind of made a, through, that, through that entity, as it were, uh, divine intelligence had the influence of enlivening something in this entity, J.C. Teft. Uh, mm -hmm. To inspire him that now is the time or whatever. So it's, just it's, take, it's take sort the of like word it, entity out of it. Yeah, well, just take the word entity out of it and just call it a movement of life. A movement of life. This, this movement and this movement uh, uh, joining together or you know do, uh, passing through, joining together, gone. Just a movement of life, but not an entity that's floating around out there waiting to zap the next person. As soon as they say, uh, you know, I'm going to give my life to God. I'm going to zap down there and do that. There's no. That isn't happening. It just it just happened in the as a universal phenomena at that moment, gone. Now a universal phenomena will take place some other moment and gone. That's the source. Just speaking, speaking through creation, uh, at, per the intelligence of the universe. But no separate entity anywhere ever is taking some distinct action. That's not really just uh, an expression of absolute reality now. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And okay. at, at the same time, the source, the source speaks through impulses. There are impulses of intelligence and they, yeah. they are ultimately one way. Just, just the way the, wa the ocean rises in waves. And the, yeah. wa the waves are nothing other than ocean. There's nothing but ocean, but yet we see waves. And so, you know, intelligence, the divine universal intelligence expresses in various forms and phenomenon and impulses. It's only, it's, it's really only, you know, the puppeteer's hand is in the puppet. There is, the puppet has no separate um, volition, but still we see puppets, you know. Right. And, and they may be gross right. puppets, subtle puppets, right. powerful puppets, weak puppets. It's just all the divine expressing through all right. these various forms. In the now, in the moment, constantly. Exactly. Yes, because I'm a writer, and what what uh, generally and what what uh, is produced is out there in stone for however knows uh, long. Mm -hmm. uh, that uh, I I become very conscious early on of of doing the best I can to use the right words, or at least words that I feel are the best pointers, because no word is the actual; it's just pointing to something, uh, and. And I also got to develop a consistency so that I try to use the same word consistently through all the works, which 
which keeps it so that people know, oh, when he says that word, he means this kind of thing. Yeah. So I tend to challenge, uh, if, I, if I'm overly challenging you on, on some of the word choices that you're using, it's just because I've gotten in the habit of not using that word for that description of things. And, uh, and that's just my habit. Sorry. No, it's okay. I think it's important, actually, um, because if we're going to use words, which we have to, if we're going to talk, we have to agree upon their definitions. Otherwise, we're speaking two different languages, you know, to yes. Tower of Babel kind of thing. And um, so I think it's important that we clarify and agree upon definitions. And I also, in a larger sense, feel like, um, you know, the whole broader spiritual community needs to evolve in this respect, not only in the, in the use of words, but in the understanding of um, what the potential is for, uh, on f for awakening and, and development of consciousness. I mean, um, you know, for instance, you and I spoke in the very beginning of this interview about the awakening being, a, being an ongoing, never-ending kind of process. Okay, well, if that is the case, then what are the various stages of it? And um, if this tradition over here is talking about this experience and that tradition over there is talking about that experience, are they talking about different stages? Are they talking about the same thing in different language? Um, it would be interesting for uh, the culture to grow in the clarity and precision of an understanding of the full range of this, uh, human potential in, in the spiritual sense um, so that we you know, understand it much more precisely as we do more objective things that science studies. Well, uh, so going to my word thing, uh, here's an example. Uh, I would not use the word stages mm -hmm. because the word stages implies level, you know, specific, here's a concept, here's a stage, here's a stage. E each stage is a concept. Mm -hmm. And and so uh, the I, I, I've gotten to look at this consistently as a what we've been talking about already, and that is the movement of life. And the and the present moment of the movement of life is just now, life in the now, observing the movement of life as it happens now. And the ongoingness of awakening is not that any any again entity is going through a stage through awakening to arrive at some other point on the other end of awakening. I never said there was an end. No, no, I didn't <laughs> I, 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 I'm not. I'm not actually, I'm just telling you how I see this. And that is that, so that um, it's just that the awakenings, uh, I think the uh, better word for those things are clarity, where the clarity gets clearer and clearer and clearer. It's like the, the water getting you know, purified over time. And so uh, the it's an ongoing process because water doesn't get clarified like that. It, it just takes, it, it just moves in that direction as the movement of life moves. Mm -hmm. And so um, awakenings tend to, maybe I could say one other thing about awakenings uh, that's I think a valid thing to Is it related to, to what you were just saying? Yes. Okay, good. And, well, kind of, and that is um, awakenings, the initial awakenings are happen, of course, in the context very much of, of a, of a um, mental, constructed being uh, you know you 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 think you've, you've developed this self that you your this is your ego self right and then all of a sudden this moment happens that's like whoa that's something quite different than this embodiment of self that i think i am and uh so because that's already built and so strong in the first place that self the awakening appears or seems to happen within the self and almost to the self, you know, like, so, and then when it goes away or fades, it's like, oh, that happened to me in the past and I remember it, but it's not happening right now because I'm back to myself again. And then, uh, but as a, as a, I can say right now, I don't have what I call, what I call awakenings anymore because there's no longer a strong self in which awakenings occur. So what it is now is just, just awareness bringing things to light. And it's not, it's not experienced like some big transformational thing. It's just, it's just, oh, 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 ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh, that's all it is. <laughs> oh, I see. Oh, I see. Oh, I see. And so that in itself is a movement away from 
mindsets toward pure awareness. And awakenings are part of that process as we go through them. And eventually, uh, it's not a matter of awakening anymore. It's just a matter of clarity. Yeah. And with, e with each new clarity, it's, oh, 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 oh. So there's no stage to it. It's just kind of like the purification of water just working its way through. Uh, uh, get the dross being burned away. The mm -hmm. attachments being lost. The death of the ego. You know, the process that takes place. Little by little by little by little by little until at one point in most of the some of these big time guys that we refer to so often, it's like it ain't there anymore. It's just gone, basically. But yeah. even in that guy that it's gone, Jesus is still sitting there in, a, in the Garden of Gethsemane wrestling with stuff. Right. So yeah. there's, you know, it's never gone, gone, gone. It's just there comes a point where there's no going back. In other words, there's no you're never going to. You're not going to become that self you once were, uh, become attached to all those things. It's more just realizing, oh, there's an attachment there. And in that realization, the attachment goes. Yeah. And you keep, you keep realizing the attachment. It goes and goes and goes. And pretty soon, there's hardly an attachment to anything. Yeah, I'm cool with all that. Um, you know, Ken Wilber uses the term states and stages. And states are more like the, the experiences you might have. And then, but whereas stages are more like stabilized degrees of, of realization or refinement. And, uh, you know, in speaking of water, you use that analogy. I mean, obviously, there are different stages in which we can find water. It can be ice yeah. or water or steam. And, you know, it's all water, but just in different degrees of different. It's just applying to show up is, in different ways. It's applying a concept to that moment and saying, well, there's water as steam. That's, that's, that's the concept is the steam. Or there's muddy water. That's the water as the other way. So it's applying a concept to it. But if you take the concept away, don't name it, then it just becomes a movement. Yeah. So, you know, with regard to stages of development, as it were, you know, you're saying that obviously there was a stage at which it was, oh, this is happening to me. I had this flashy experience. Oh, I hope I yes. hang on to it. I hope I don't lose it, whatever. Yes, and then yes, later yes. on, that all passes. And it's, but yes, there, yes. there's still like, as you said, oh, oh, you know, just sort of different degrees yes. of, of refinement or clarity. And, and, you know, it could be that those could actually be defined uh, if they were, it, it's like, how do we define anything? Everybody dreams, right? So we, uh, and it's a universal enough experience that we, and, and we've correlated it with physiological, you know, um, activities so that we all agree that there is this thing called the dreaming state. And um, so it could very well be that if, if, you know, higher consciousness, whatever we want to call it, were as common as dreaming, in other words, pretty much everybody experienced it, that uh, we, we could begin to parse it out uh, much more precisely the way, you know, Inuits parse out names for snow. They got about 30 of them. <laughs> and uh, that there would be, you know, very sort of fine gradations could be delineated. Uh, for instance, there could be a stage at which the self is cre clearly realized, you know, one rests in and as pure awareness, and yet uh, the, the world is seen as separate or different or, you know, detached from oneself, then there could be a stage at which that separation began to diminish and one began to appreciate much more refined values of, of the relative world such that they were hardly discernible from pure consciousness and so on. There could be all kinds of, of subtle gradations and delineations if as a culture we understood this stuff more commonly. So what you just described, you see, is, is science. Yeah, yeah, I'm saying, that. yeah, exactly. Because science, science, what science does, they, they, they drill down into the, you know, the quantumist and the subquantumist particle you can find, and they're still looking for more particles, and they just keep looking for particles. But, but in the end, no particle is gonna, gonna be the perfect, you know, description of the universe because there's no such thing because it's all just a movement, and so, it's the, it's the, it's the transformational moment when the, the whole process is seen as mental structures of mind and the awareness is what is observing the process so to speak and so there's a distinction in that way mm -hmm. and there could even be a stage at which this whole process seen as mental structures of mind and the, and the awareness observing it merges into a greater wholeness in which 
this whole process, which was once seen as mental processes of mind, is seen actually as the very same awareness which was observing it. So a larger wholeness dawns. A, a, That's a, the death of a, the witness. A, a greater unity. Yeah, the death of the witness. The death of the witness. That's, the, say, the last vestige of, of, uh, of, of ego is, is the, the, the witness, which is still sort of in this, in this go-between place of, right. you know, that eventually, awareness, that eventually awareness, does dissolve. And that which we are aware of. Right. You know? And so it, when that goes, then there's just nothing but pure awareness. Yeah. <laughs> and yet we can still function in the world uh, because, yes. because of that, <laughs> that Laisha Vidya thing that I mentioned earlier where, you know, things are seen predominantly in, in terms of what they are, pure awareness. But yeah. secondarily, there's this faint remains of appreciation of distinction and difference. Sure. Has, well, to, has to be daily for, life, um, you know, for human beings, especially now, require uh, concepts of mind to go about their business and yeah, you know, yeah. drive a car, whatever. But but it it it's it's it gets way out of bounds when it starts getting, going down the judge, you know, the attachment to the judgment thing and the boom 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 boom, and then you got all this uh, conflict, war, and the whole deal, which is at the other extreme of that. Yeah. And what you said a minute ago about, oh, that's science, you're talking about the scientific method. Yeah, that's what I was intending to imply, that, that this stuff is actually amenable to uh, a scientific approach if it were repeatable enough and, uh, you know, by enough people, which is one of the criterion of the scientific method. And, you know, we could begin to sort of define it in a more universally agreed upon fashion if enough people were having the same experiences that they could compare notes and, you know, you could even set up theories. Okay, if you do this, that, and the other thing, there's going to eventually be this experience. And, okay, well, I'll do that and I'll see if you're right or not. <laughs> the only thing about that I, I, I want to say is that you see, when the whole seeking of to, to know process ends, mm -hmm. then there's no need to know anymore. And so, uh, because the, 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 the reality is now. And in the now is what the truth is, right now. Mm -hmm. And right now, and right now, and right now. And there's no need to know anything other than that. So, but look at yourself. No, no matter how, no matter how far you drill down, until that is is separated, if you will. Uh, that's a horrible word, but until that is, until the clarity of that comes, you're still drilling in this world of mind concept. Mm. But look at yourself. I mean, you're you're enthusiastic about this stuff. You're writing. You're you're producing videos. It's like I don't know whether you you f your motivation is because it enables your own knowledge to become more clear, or whether you just want to impart what you've what you've come to if know. I, if, but if maybe I may, this, maybe both. This brings up a very good point, and I'm glad to uh, speak to this. And that is that this is goes back to the it takes one to know one, which is the the paradox of all this, because. You can read, uh, you know, ancient teachings so the cows come home until there's a little bit of clarity in you, you aren't going to get it. So when the clarity starts to, to, to vibrate a little bit, then, then it's, oh, I see what he means by that. It's not quite the literal word. It's something beyond that. And, and you can go on and on through all that stuff that way. So that it takes th that clarity here first before the understanding comes of all the rest of it uh, in the sense of pure awareness so uh, what I when I when you point to this and rightly so actually I had to read a lot of stuff that I have to be honest with you a lot of it bored me to death I, I it's you know science I, I never I, I I'm not a physicist I didn't take uh, I have a friend who's a physicist and two of them actually and they they helped me sort of I would pose questions once in a while and they'd say, no, not that this or something, just so I could understand the science of it a little bit better. But I read, I read a fair amount in that world, not because I was trying to understand something in myself regarding science. It was just that I had to show how scientific discoveries in modern era might point to this reality that that's there, this, this, this beyond mind thing. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I just developed a lot of 
stuff about that, but he, I can't go to a physics seminar and talk to you about physics. You know, I'm the last guy in the world to do that. What I can talk to you about is, well, maybe the, you know, the packets of energy and the vortexes and stuff, they, they represent thoughts and, you know, I don't know, just stuff uh, in, in, that has to do with coming to a clarity in, in the nature of pure awareness. What, what science generally ignores is consciousness itself. Yeah. They, they keep looking at the phenomena, but they're, they're ignoring what is looking at the phenomena. See? And what, what my works are about is we're, gonna, we're trying to point to what is looking at the phenomena, not the phenomena itself. So I use those, the, the facts that they've, the, and the theories of that to help point to, the, to what's looking, not, not to take a side on one theory versus another any of that stuff. It's, I, I have no, you know, even though I, I, I could see David Bohm's theory to me was the closest to how I understand the nature of consciousness expression out of one source that I found anywhere in all in reading about other things. It, other things just let, felt like dead ends to me. Yeah. Other than holographic. Oh, the holograph. I read a wonderful book that a guy wrote who's no longer living uh, about the holographic universe. And that really spoke to me in a big way, too. Just the nature of everything being integrated and interconnected. Yeah, I think I've read but, about that. Um, yeah, I guess I just I brought up the science point just because I, fig, I feel like one of the downsides of religion is that it hasn't, in a way, it hasn't been scientific. You know, I mean, there's been so much bigotry and warfare and all kinds of stuff because... Uh, people became attached to beliefs without actually experiencing what those beliefs were supposed to represent and you know killing each other in the name of God and so on and so the scientific uh, revolution when it came along was kind of an antidote to that and, and you know let's get away from all that nonsense and find out what's yes. really going on and now yes. there's there's sort of a marrying of science and spirituality as represented mm -hmm. by things like the science and non-duality conference where spiritual people and scientific people are, are trying to understand yes. to what extent they're actually talking the same language and generally they conclude yes. that they are they just have to sort of find you know clarify their terms and and find out where they're meeting one another and and personally i think that all this spiritual stuff <laughs> has tremendous implications in a world where science without the spiritual dimension has brought us to the brink of extinction potentially uh, and it has tremendous implications for uh, you know environmental issues and uh, GMOs and um, all kinds of things um, it, it will recreate a balance or create one for the very first time perhaps mm -hmm. in, in which we you know are fully alive in not only our brains, our, our intellects, but also our hearts and our, our gut, our soul. And that, that balance could bring about a, a, an unprecedented quality of, of life for the mm -hmm. world. Well, and, and you, to me, my lights, you're using the right word when you say spirituality and science, not religion and science. Right, right. Re and, religion, religion to me implies and, belief and rituals religion and all, all that Religion is just stuff. ancient beliefs. Yeah, you yeah. Know, and, and, and to follow on what you just said, and, and very well said, is that um, it's interesting if you look at it that the, the only uh, subject, we'll call it that, that, uh, that still has a firm grip on human beings today from ancient times is religion. From ancient Think times, of it. yeah. They're still quoting stuff 2,000 years. I mean, they're still teaching what they taught 2,000 years ago today. What other subject what other category of anything do we teach today that that is related to what they taught 2000 years ago or 3000 years ago nothing well, just religion. in a way you know maybe we teach agriculture today but obviously it's, it's in a much more sophisticated form than it was 2000 years ago oh we, yeah well that, i mean i mean it, that that has completely you know that's scientifically based it's 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 yeah. completely uh, different it's not what they taught 2,000 years ago at all. Right, and so what you're trying to do, and what I'm alluding to here, is bringing a, the science 
scientific way of thinking to spirituality and thereby ridding it of the ridiculousness that um, had had come to dominate through you know just a merely yes. religious or belief based approach and you know actually separating the wheat from the chaff and, and realizing that there there's a whole lot of valuable stuff there but putting it in a context in which is practical for the modern era and which is free of all the stuff that has given religion a bad name you could I mean, in my view, uh -huh. <laughs> you could chuck religion all together tomorrow and the world would be better off because it, those 2000 year old things that are keep, continue to be hammered home and shoved down people's throats and believe in this and this will happen and all that stuff is just ancient myth and legend that has nothing to do with anything that has to do with truth. No, but the heart of it, the gist of it, the core of it, is actually truth with capital T. Well, the, you the just, teachings, yeah. when, you, when you pluck out the teachings of, let's say, Jesus, that are that that they say is the uh, you know started Christianity. He didn't start Christianity. He didn't start any religion. He 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 just taught, and uh, the the religion took his teachings and then encapsulated into a doctrinal <laughs> thing, rituals and all that stuff. Yeah. So it's that stuff that has, that keeps bringing more conflict and nonsense into the world. I mean, look at what's going on now, Muslim and, you know, all that stuff. It's just, that's all 2,000 year old ancient stuff that just doesn't seem to go away. Yeah, there's a great story where the God, where God and the devil were walking down the road and, and the God, God reached down and picked something up and put it in his pocket and the devil said, what's that? And uh, God said, oh, it's truth. And the devil said, oh, give it to me. I'll organize it for you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, this, my, uh, I'm yeah. sorry, go ahead. I just, you, you, my dad said that one thing, once uh, he admitted later in life, that early, in the early stages of his awakenings and so forth, he, he started writing letters to some people. And this is back in the 50s, you know. Uh, 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 there wasn't internet and all that stuff. And to, to, to try and organize it. And he said, I spent several years trying to organize it until it hit me. <laughs> it's already a perfectly organized, and I don't need to organize a thing. It's just going to happen as it happens, you know, yeah. just, just teaching or whatever. So a rather long question came in, and uh, Irene edited it a bit, so for clarity and, and some brevity. I'll read it to you. I think you'll find it interesting. Your father once said that what had changed him so was when he realized that the Christ is not a person. How did he, and this is long, so you're going to have to remember the various points of this. How did he see Christ, and uh, how do you see him or it? Um, maybe I better let you, should I, should I read the whole thing, Irene, or should I just uh, Why don't you stop there? Let me, go let me bit, deal with bit the, by bit and let him deal with the bits. Let's do that. Let's, you, let me deal with the bits. Yeah, you do it's that bit. For me. Okay. Uh, well, he always, because uh, he, he uh, as I said, uh, he was introduced to the Bible through English lit in college. And then it went from there. Uh, so then because of his uh, noviceness, you know, to, to the whole thing, he just, he wanted to study the Bible more. So he thought, well, if I go to divinity school, I'll, I'll find some answers. So he went to Yale divinity school, but he didn't find his answers there and nothing wrong with the school. But I mean, you know, that's not where, the answers he was seeking lies. And uh, so, but nevertheless, that was the sort of career path that he took. So he ended up in a church. It was a non-denominational, uh, it's a non-denominational non church and so forth. So he never was big on, you know, all kinds of specific stuff, doctrinal. He was, and he, he himself all through it kept struggling with this whole business about who was this guy, Jesus. And and his teach he couldn't he couldn't mesh his teachings with what what the church said about them, he and so he just kind of went his own way in that within the context of the church for a while, until at some until finally, some awakenings occurred and then he left the church because it wasn't a place for him to speak anymore, and um, uh, so when he said to that fellow. Uh, who had worked with him before, it was a, another minister who had worked with him briefly before, who came in on his deathbed, really, and, and he'd heard that he was ill. So he came to see him, and he hadn't seen this guy in years, and the fellow just said to him at that time, well, gee, you know, you are the most, um, I, I, I can't remember the exact words, but, the, you know, 
meaningful minister I ever worked with, and, and you, you, you had a definite impact on me. And so he asked the question, what, what, ha what, what was it in you that changed it for you? And Dad had never been asked that question before, and he just reflected a bit, and then he just said, well, <laughs> and that's, <laughs> see, I can't talk about my brother. I'd like to. <laughs> I can't. He said, well, uh, I guess it when, I, when I realized that the Christ is not a person. In other words, it isn't, you know, not this person, son of God thing. And uh, so that became the title of the book. And what he was saying, you know, if you peel back that, what he was saying is the Christ, and, and actually if you go back to the original, the Christos or Christus or whatever, which is the original word in Greek, refers like, to, it's like the logos, it's like the, the it's like consciousness. Uh, it, it, it's etymology leads to that type of a thing. So he began, started calling it the Christ mind in us. And uh, uh, that was just, his words that he used to describe pure awareness, and uh, uh, so that's what that that's what how how he sort of moved that away from the person of Jesus to Christ consciousness in us, and that's how he saw it. To answer the, your questioner's question, okay, that's how he understood the Christ as consciousness, not not a person named Jesus. Right. Okay. Good. Um, this, this series of questions, by the way, is from Suzanne in London. Um, and so here's the second one. Last two weeks ago, I interviewed uh, an Episcopal, young Episcopal minister named Matthew Wright, who's a really wonderful, bright fellow. And um, in the interview with Matthew, he said something to the sense that we should not take all of the sayings literally, but rather as ideas born through the Christian tradition later ascribed to Jesus. Biblical sayings ascribed to Jesus, such as, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father but through me, or for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Jesus Christ. Would you agree with Matthew, or is there perhaps more to it? Would you, oh, okay, I, 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 I guess the question is, would what, you... What, what am I agreeing to if I... Yeah, agree with um, sure. Would you agree with Matthew that these types of sayings were not necessarily things Christ himself said, but that yes. perhaps things that later on proselytizers might have put into his mouth, so to speak, um, in, or, in order to kind of buttress their argument that, you know, theirs was the, the best and only way. Yes, absolutely. Well, in fact, when they sort of put the Christian religion together in the Council of N N Nicaea, Nicaea, mm -hmm. Nicaea 375 or something like that. Uh, there was a lot of cherry picking it, going it, on. Well, you know, they had... Rome, uh, Constantine was the guy who wanted this because he was trying to uh, stop all the warring factions from, from destroying the realm. So he brought these guys in and said, I want to make Christianity the, the Christian, you know, the, the official the religion, yeah. official religion of the realm. So you guys figure out what that is and then we'll, we'll make everybody adhere to it. <laughs> and... Uh, so it's a political move on his part. It had nothing to do with any, you know, conscience of his. And secondly, um, they lived. You know, the people out there in Rome were were fundamentally pagans, and the pagans had all these gods and views of things, and you know. So, so what they did is just took a lot of pagan traditions, or a lot of pagan myths, and so forth, and tried to pluck and and can you know revise. Ah, uh, yeah, like Christmas, and then apply it to Jesus, like Christmas, like. Exactly, a birthday on Christmas had to do with a pagan thing. Right. Uh, the Son of God thing is all is is the keeping the the tradition of God's you know paganism God things up here. Only we got one God, so we're we're going to look at the one Son of God here. You know, I don't know what all their thinking was, but so a lot of the stuff that came out of Christianity back then was was revised paganism, overlaid onto some stuff that they created Christianity. And there's no question because even those those, uh, um, uh, what do you call the, the four Gospels, <laughs> uh, were, were I, I read once, well, there was some probably at the time of that meeting, or maybe it was a different one, but near thereabouts, uh, when they were just deciding what was going to be in the Bible and what wasn't going to be in the Bible, um, there were some 80, some so-called Gospels extant everywhere. But a lot of them, I think, were probably, could well, be, 
closer to what Jesus taught than the ones they actually picked. Sure. Because, because the ones they actually picked justified all their Jesus, Son of God stuff. And, um, well, and look, the, look they, at the Gospel of Thomas, you know, which is found in the, the Nag Hammadi scrolls. And it was... Um, it's a purer gospel. Yeah, than, yeah. Didn't, you know, go, didn't go through all that. Closer to the teachings. Editorial the committees. Stuff. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, and not only the gospel writers themselves, who wrote decades after Jesus was crucified, and anywhere from 30 to 70 years after he was crucified. And you imagine, you know, if you wrote what this guy said in your life 30 years ago, what could you say about that? Yeah. Obviously, it's passed down orally, and there are other writings that they depended upon and so forth. But they were just putting together a story as best they could. They never met him. They weren't at his, at his, his you know, any time he talked to him. They didn't know him. So they created this myth, this legend. And there's a lot, not a, I don't know how much, but there's quite a bit of stuff in there. And the one you quoted or she wrote, uh, uh, the questioner wrote, is a perfect one to say that that was clearly added after the fact, if not by the gospel writer himself, by the church later on. And those kinds of things, once one has some clarity about the nature of pure consciousness, you can spot that in an instant in the Bible and just go, well, you know that Jesus didn't say that. Yeah. He could never, he wasn't an enlightened being and could not say that right there. Actually, there's a final part to her question here that, that pertains to what you just said, you know, regarding such sayings as I am the way, the truth, and life, and, and so on. She said, yeah. uh, Stephen Ford, whom somebody that I had interviewed a few months ago, mentioned that after his awakening, he came to realize that Christ is the I am, the pure consciousness, and yes. that, is, that is free from attachment to mental, emotional, and physical constructs through which the unmanifested field of potentiality, the kingdom, can manifest itself and so know itself. This would seem to put in an amazing perspective the above sayings ascribed to Jesus, such as, I am the way, the truth, and life. Um, yes. Yeah, what do you think? You've kind of been saying what you think about that. <laughs> well, it's just the, the, it's the, the I. You know, I, we, there is the I am that's used by a lot of people, and including me at times, but the but the focus is on the am and not the i, and what the church did is take the focus away from the am and to the i by saying that i is Jesus, right. the person of Jesus, and the i amness is just the the, the expression of now, the isness of now, i amness. Uh, 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 it's just like what it is, I think it's Jeff Foster or somebody who just says you. you know, you are God. Get over it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And actually, speaking of God, you know, we, we speak of awakening to pure consciousness and all. There, there's also talk in traditions and, and also contemporary realizers of God consciousness, of actually sort of yes. having God become an experiential reality, not just consciousness in a plain vanilla sense, but that sort of divine intelligence um, permeating and orchestrating everything. And if we think of that, then you really have to know who you are before you can know what that is. Um, as, as my former teacher once said, that, if you, that God couldn't even telephone from a distance if you had not first established self-realization. You'd be crushed by the immensity of the experience. So you really, you really need that, that as the foundation for God-realization. God yeah. yeah. Well, there has... I don't know about the thought process of all that, but certainly the embodiment. I mean, uh, uh, the expression that is you or the expression that is Sam or Sarah or me mm -hmm. is, uh, is born out of the universal expression of human beings. And then that expression certainly has certain capacities or not in certain ways. And it's, and it's also like the, you know, sprinkling things by the wayside in some 30-fold and 60-fold and 100-fold and that sort of thing. Plants, animals, they all have different, you know, functions, different realities, different fields that they respond to. So it's true that uh, there's an awful lot of human beings really, they would be burned up if they, if they're, if an awake, they couldn't, uh, they can't awaken, you know, they, yeah. they won't, their the capacity is not there, the, there's not enough battery to take the charge. No, absolutely. I was just engaging in an email correspondence with a, a fellow in Australia who had, um, 
written about a number of friends of his who were longtime spiritual practitioners who ended up having mental breakdowns and so on. And, and then I brought a few other friends into it, such as Craig Holliday and Francis Bennett, whom I've interviewed. And we got into this conversation about um, how preparedness for the immensity of the of, of experience is so necessary, purification and strengthening of the nervous system, and, and also how in monastic settings such as Francis Bennett has been in, there's a very careful screening process to make sure people are actually going to be able to handle it because it can get very intense and, and can be too much if, if, you're not, if, the, if there isn't sufficient um, preparation. Yes. Um, a good question came in. This is from. I, I, oh, go ahead. I, you want to comment I want on that? Just, just the word preparation. Uh -huh. That um, uh, I would hold that that preparation is you know that teaching that you know, to those who are prepared, for instance. Mm -hmm. Well, it isn't a mental preparation really, or it isn't something that one can do to prepare oneself or study to prepare oneself. Because either the mind-body organism is made prepared by the universe itself, or it's not. It has to be a universal reality. It can't be a, an illusion of mind who thinks I'm preparing for this. Um, I would disagree. You know, I mean, Jesus said, don't pour new wine into old wineskins. And what yoga and things like that are all about is preparing the wineskin, you know, preparing the vessel f to make it capable of... But if, of, you're, if you're moved to do yoga... Yeah, if you're moved. Then the, then the movement is spontaneous, okay. And if you're not moved, but then if, it's a moot point. If, 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 yeah, in a way. So it, just by saying, oh, I'm, I don't really want to do that, but I'm going to go over there and do some yoga because I know I'll be prepared if I do some yoga... It isn't going to make a difference, particularly. Uh, it has to. It has to. Maybe it's easy way to say it is just whatever the movement, whatever the movement is, it has to arise from within. It cannot be superimposed from without. No, I agree. And actually, in a larger context, I would say that whatever you're doing, or whatever appear to be doing, or whatever is happening, is in the big picture preparation because we're all yeah. we're all moving in this. It's all preparation. Yeah, it, all, it is. Whatever. The entire universe is. Exactly. It's ex ex in ex exhaustive preparation for whatever's next. One big cosmic finishing school. <laughs> <laughs> um, here's a good question from Cheryl in Tennessee. She asks, if there really is no choice and God or source is making all the choices, then why do we make wrong choices? Well, who's, who's deciding what's wrong and what's right? Yeah, but like, why does somebody become a heroin addict, or why does somebody go and murder people, or whatever? Um, if God, if God is really pulling the strings, why, yeah, no, why do people do? But there isn't. Things? See, this is still looking at it in, in dualistic terms. God out here pulling strings to the puppet, me over here, you know, choosing or not choosing good or bad choice. If you look at it this way, maybe, uh, what if God is experiencing life as a drug addict? See, not your life, life, but God's life. Right. Or as a murderer. Or as, yeah, or as a murderer. Or as a murderee. <laughs> or as a murderer. Right. What if God is experiencing life as Hitler? Yeah. See? Well, obviously, I mean, everything that's living is experiencing life as the universe wants it to take place, so to speak. I mean, I don't mean that there's a preordained. I don't, I'm not saying it's all planned out. I just mean that... If you're a tree, you're not going to be a, 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 a deer. You're going to be a tree. And so, and you're going to act as a tree and respond as a tree and live as a tree within the realm of freedom. Yep. And uh, same thing for human beings. And you're also different, whole variety of trees and bushes and the whole nine yards. Well, there's a variety of human beings and, and the whole nine yards. So each, they're all living within the context of that, that expression at that time. And um, and there, so I lost the, the the thread, the initial thread here. Just that um, I think what you're getting at is that. Um, well, oh, wait, no, go ahead. Bad and good. Yeah. It's it's the mind that moves in and says this is a bad thing and it's a good thing. The ego is looking at that and say, well, bad thing to be a drug addict, so I'm going to choose this over here and be a you know not a drug addict or I'm going to have a career in this way, help you whatever it is, the, the ego. 
the 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 happening is just occurring the career or the movement toward whatever is just occurring the ego steps in and says i am doing this that's the illusion or i am choosing this another illusion the fact is the universe is experiencing life as a drug addict through that human experience is experiencing life as uh rick archer in this human experience and so on and so on and so on all across the board once you get the mental concept of bad and good which is judgment out of the picture then then there, there need not be any judgment mm -hmm. they're just these oh that's that and this is this and i don't if, if that drug addict is going to come out of drug addictness it's going to happen from within it isn't going to be happening because somebody else moves in and scruffs him by the neck you know and says don't do this anymore that doesn't work now that doesn't mean that two people might be, brought, might be brought together to help resolve that issue that could happen but it's still that movement has to happen from within every movement every legitimate movement has to happen from within in a in, in, in a in a driven in a motivation from the universe kind of way for it to be valuable yeah would you uh, agree that uh, that there's such a thing as hot and cold fast and slow heavy and light you know dark and light um, various oh, con various parallel contrasting yes that's 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 all in the magnetic uh, field of things yeah for every action is a reaction or for every every you know right pleasure pain the whole thing it's all it's all in the realm of phenomena right so and in I, fact everything in phenomena has an uh both of those sides including except include, light except photons of light yeah true <laughs> photons of light are the one thing that that are differentiated than all other particles all other particles have 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 a you know a, mm -hmm. a, a relationship with something that is an opposite yeah, so I, the reason I brought, asked that question is that I would say that um, if we don't have a problem with hot and cold, fast and slow, you know, big and small, all these pairs of opposites, yes. then we, should, we also shouldn't have a problem with good and evil. It's just, um, it, no. it, it, there's, you know, it's just another, another of those relative polarities. And, um, it's just I, a I, cultural thing to keep society in play, to say, well, these things are bad, and we as a culture have decided that's bad, and in fact, if you break this rule over here we're going to throw you in jail for a while or whatever and this over here is good we like that and so that's going to happen it keeps things sort of somewhat settled but it doesn't really because what it creates is this tremendous tension and conflict in society that's just battle 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 all you need is love say, say the beatles and right. that's correct because if, if love ruled the world then there would be no bad or good it would just the love would just take care of the moment in the moment if it did, because there would be so much um, yeah. unifying influence that these these polarities would no longer sort of be so extreme. But yes. um, but what I'm suggesting is that um, you know just as in the universe, irrespective of human judgment, there are such things as fast and slow and hot and cold. You know, which the latter is a measure of how fast my molecules are vibrating. I'm mm -hmm. saying that there could be also some you know negative and positive qualities in creation which right. are not merely human judgment and that you know through the human lens we see it, that it's bad to rape children and good to feed the homeless or something like that there mm -hmm. there are there are it, it's not just sort of our arbitrary superficial capricious um value yeah. judgments on things that there is See, see I mean, the reason I'm saying this kind of thing yeah. is a lot of times when people talk non-duality, they kind of try to wipe out all relative distinctions and mm -hmm. um, and brush all that aside as if as if relative distinctions are meaningless, um, and oh, they're just merely conceptions, and we and we we're beyond those, you know. But I I would say that we, you know, we can appreciate the non-dual nature of things without um, losing our appreciation of relative distinctions you know we might prefer bernie sanders over donald trump for instance and yet be a highly enlightened person <laughs> so going back to what you said a while back about the heart or the mind the mind heart sort of connecting right and have playing together there's the, uh, there's a whole there's a segment of that in, in one of the videos about that i have it right here you say um 
let's see, you say, it is estimated that at least half of the cells of the heart are actually neurons with clusters of ganglia attached, just like the brain. And at least one aggregate of the heart's neural ganglia connects directly to the spinal cord, right. um, thus to the nervous system of the entire body, just like the brain. And you can take it from here, but... Yes. Yeah. Exactly. And so, what, what, what you're kind of pointing to, I think, is... Uh, in the element of all that good and bad and stuff like that going on, there's also compassion. Yes. And compassion is a relative term. Mm -hmm. And it is in the experiential realm. It is a, almost a feeling. And so uh, the difference between just the intellect looking at those and then reacting accordingly, the, or those being bad, good things and reacting accordingly, when the heart comes into play, then there's an amelioration because there's, a, there's another kind of movement that ta that that gets involved which you can relate to love if you will that that ta that brings a softness to it and brings a caringness to it and brings those kind of things so on the level of phenomena that would be good phenomena shall we say yeah, yeah. and and I, the way i dealt with that in the book is uh, the evil good and evil thing is that anything is good that supports the awakening of conscious awareness and things that are bad are things that do not support the awakening of conscious awareness. That's a really good way of putting it. So it, 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 not, not being an intellectual division, but just things that support what the universe is doing, which is unfolding and, and expanding uh, in those ways versus tr being restrictive and, and uh, resistive and all the other stuff, which is to, to dis separate from that movement, if you will. Yeah. Um, uh, so in that vein, relativeness has a meaning for sure. It's, it can't be just, I mean, it can be, but it can't, it, it doesn't be. need to be rejected. Right. Uh, or, or to, whatever. But what the non-duality guys are saying, I believe, I don't want to put words in their mouth, but I would s simply say this too, that the, the ultimate answer to everything is complete clarity on the fact that, that to the complete displacement, displacement of mental constructs of mind and attachment there too. So what they're saying is the if you really want the real bottom line answer to the absolute living truth of things, you need to get completely disengaged with that whole realm. And so uh, uh, when, when we try to bring it back to well, but we want to move around in this way, well, we aren't we aren't doing that. The movement around in that realm is taking place naturally and spontaneously, as we've already said. And so. That, that movement of compassion is a spontaneous thing. The movement of choice is a spontaneous thing. Um, it's just when the illusion is gone, then the movement takes place all by itself, naturally, spontaneously, effortlessly, without there being the, the false illusion that there's someone entity choosing to do this or not. Yeah, I would just say that the bottom line is not disengaged from the whole thing. The bottom line, that's a stage, but after that, the bottom line becomes re-engaged. I and my father are one. Whatsoever you do unto the least of these, you do unto me. You know, yes. The golden rule thing. You eventually see yeah. that, you know, you are the suffering person. You are the, the terrorist, yes. you know, guy and, and all that stuff. And so that's where compassion comes in, where, where you, 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 there's not this old cold, aloof, detached kind of relationship to other people or the world. There is a sort of an infinite intimacy with, with everyone and everything where, you know, you feel as, yeah. as much as they feel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. There is a difference. It's funny because there's a there's also a difference between seeing something and moving to something. And so you, you'll you'll find a lot of these. Picture the Buddha, for instance. It's, oddly enough, he could see, I think, into what you just said. Mm -hmm. At the same time, if somebody had an well, it wouldn't be an auto accident in his day, but let's just rickshaw accident. Yeah. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you know, and, and, and whatever. He wouldn't necessarily he wouldn't necessarily be the first responder. Mm, I don't know. Uh, not, I'm not. I'm not. I'm, I'm not Why not? saying. I'm just saying. There's nothing. Well, I'm not saying not. I'm not saying he wouldn't necessarily be the first responder, because that might come from another place in the in the environment of what's there, and so the first responder is the first responder, and the Buddha is the Buddha. 
He had yeah, his capabilities, in other words. It doesn't mean the Buddha wasn't compassionate. It just means that he wasn't the one moved to, to deal with that. So it isn't an automatic, that was what I'm saying, I guess, that, for instance, uh, uh, enlightened guys are going to go around and give to all the charities and, no, and go, go help the homeless and, you know, make a move to all that stuff, even yeah. though they could recognize there's, a, there's an issue there. Yeah, well, you and I aren't in Africa trying to feed the starving children. Exactly. We're here doing this because this yes. we feel that this is the way in which yes. we can be useful. But yes. but we also perhaps we can't do everything. I mean, we're not born to do everything. We're no. born to do what we do. We're sense organs know? of the infinite. The the index figure, you know, yeah, yeah, you yeah. can't walk on it. It has its yeah, function. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and there's there's already stuff going on over another some other place. Another one of these going on, taking care of that. You know, we don't need to take care of all that. Yeah, I'm with yeah. you. Yeah. All right. Well, let's see. We've been going on pretty long here. Um, uh, and obviously, as I said in the beginning, I, I, I knew I was going to enjoy this conversation and want to make it a long interview because there's so much to cover. But um, is there anything, I mean, sure there are a thousand things we haven't covered, but is there anything you feel is, is critical to put into the, this interview here that you'd like you know, you know, to mention before we wrap it up? Well, you know, it's hard. Uh, the ultimate end to all this discussion is is really point all about pointing to that that dropping away of those the egoic attachments and those subtle those subtle things which are very much in the in the energy field of who we are, and so uh, nothing in what we are talking about here, at least from my perspective, uh, if one takes the stuff that we talked about the material and trying to analyze it and decipher it and say, well, this word, you know, and that word over there, oh, that's a better word, and pointing to all that kind of stuff and trying to organize it, as you put it, and move it around and make it make sense and all that stuff. That's still the functioning of mind, just, just moving checkerboards around. And until one gets clarity on that issue, then, then genuine awakening hasn't begun and so uh, when the awakening begins then you got to start looking at all those issues and see where your attachments are and as one by one or groups of thing uh, uh, here's here's a quick story which relates to this and this is when I was much younger uh, before I s could say what I'm saying now but I um, I had at the time I was I'll say in my uh, 30s or something, um, uh, a a big knot in my in my belly area that just kept it was just there. It was like a you know a fist in my stomach, and um, I didn't know what it was. I mean, I didn't think of it in terms of an illness, but it just was there, a tension. And uh, I spent several months just looking at it, as best I knew how to look at something. In other words, I I would try to disengage from it just by looking and seeing it and just uh, not wondering what it was, but just kept looking at the tension. And uh, it, would, it would subside. Putting some attention on it. Putting some attention on it. Just, just paying attention to it, I guess, mm -hmm. yeah. And, I, and then, uh, and it took several months, but I remember it, it was at a time, a moment when this happened was not a time I was consciously attending to it, this. Because that, uh, oh, I should add that every awakening I've ever had moment has always been in a moment of repose. It's mm -hmm. never been a moment. It's never come at a time when I was somehow engaged. Mm -hmm. It's always come as a surprise, you know, like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that seems to be the environment that's required for something like that to take place. So that environment was, was in this circumstance. And all of a sudden, this tension just released. And the, the, impression of it, the vision of it, if you will, was a big barge in a river broke free from the pilings and just started floating down the river and disappeared. And on that barge was a lot of resentment that I had mm. towards someone. Mm -hmm. And and from that day forward, that that not never came back. And so I, I uh, it's not in looking at these things, it's, it's looking at our attachment to, to things that we don't even realize we're attached to. 
And when a feeling arises, for instance, we're attached to that feeling as long as we think we are, that's my feeling I'm having. And so just look at it in detached fashion, if you will. And, and, uh, or, and anyway. And in a state any, of repose, like you said. Any state, yes, yeah. any state, and so forth. And if, if that attention is applied there, for the most part, it seems that that'll probably get dealt with. Rather than trying to go in and analyze it with your mind, you know, oh, what's wrong with that and whatever, and I'll take a pill and I'll fix that and, you know, all that. It isn't going to go away that way. It's going to stay there. It might subside and just, but it's going to stay out here in the in the energy field, and it isn't going to go away until there's a disconnect. Until the, and that, yeah. when that disconnect occurs, that's that's the equivalent of an awakening, at yeah. least with respect to that particular issue. And like you so, say, it was a it was a tension. So you, that implies a, yes. phys, a physical sensation. Yes. And uh, so what I would suggest is that you know these things are detectable by virtue of some, our, uh, some physical sensation we notice. Some yes. so, some tension, some pain, yes. some some constriction, something. And uh, like you say, it's not something to be analyzed intellectually. But if we oh. if we let it, let ourselves settle into a more reposed meditative kind of state and let our attention kind of dwell on the physical sensation yes that helps to unwind it that helps to helps to yes. resolve it and, and release it, it yeah it does seem to be true and that's been my experience and so i would say to your listeners that uh, that to me the whole thing is becoming is is uh, detaching from Every phenomena that seems to be rise as an experience mm -hmm. in your human experience, in what we call your human experience, and no matter what, it, you know, all, even pleasure, if you, if you find your, you know, ecstasy and all this stuff that you're trying to do whatever to, to accomplish that kind of a thing, that's that's the same thing. It's just on the other side of the magnet, uh, magnetic field we're talking about, pleasure pain business. So all of those things we get attached to. And they become our addiction, and it's just looking at the addiction, and and in that in that observation, uh, it it's it, t it it's it's t dealt with from there. Yeah, I just want to add that initially, when you do that, um, it may seem that the sensation begins to become more acute, you know, more uncomfortable, yes. uncomfortable or something. And but that's and there's a kind of a human tendency to want to run away from that. And that's why yeah. people take drugs and all to block out everything. But right, right. but actually, if you let yourself t turn in the other direction and actually feel it and be aware of it, even if it becomes more acute, you it's only becoming more acute because it's actually beginning to work itself out now. And yes. and if you just sort of let yourself ride through that process, It'll yeah. it'll dissipate yeah. and and then be less and it may happen in one big poof like you said with with your thing or it might just yeah. chip away at it in little increments yeah. but one way or the other it it, it diminishes it yes yes yeah. so there it is <laughs> <laughs> okay great that's a practical note to end on I guess give people a little technique to work with <laughs> well I I I'm not. Um, uh, I really enjoyed this, and uh, thank you very much for having me, and I'd be glad to do it again sometime. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed it, too, and, I, and <laughs> thanks to whoever it was that alerted me to your videos. It must have been that somebody emailed those to me and said, hey, look at these. These are cool, and, and yes. I just put them on my iPad to watch whenever I had a chance. And, uh, Great. Um, I think they're be beautifully done. Um, so I'll be creating a page on BatGap, of course, where I link to your website, and there people will be able to find, and which is just jcteft.com, T-E-F-F-T, and people will be able to find, um, you know, your videos. And I'll also link to your book on Amazon, so people can buy that if you like. And it exists as a Kindle v version for only four bucks or something. Um, mm -hmm. And also, the hardcover is more expensive. Is the hardcover still in print? I noticed it was like seventy bucks. Well, uh, the book is a uh, what do they call it? It's a it's a it doesn't get printed until it's ordered. So oh, to, print on demand. There was you print on demand, so yeah. it's not. It, it was never uh, other than when it nursery came out. There was uh, some. Uh, so they they I think they printed about five hundred of them because mm. it got ordered into a wholesaler house. I see. And, and that sort of thing, but uh, but now it it just. Yeah, it's per order, it gets printed and sent. Okay, great. Um, well, probably a bunch of people will order it and enjoy it. <laughs> well, so thanks, JC. I've really enjoyed this conversation. Thank and you. Um, thanks to those who've been listening or watching. Um, 
I, I usually go through all these things at the end of an interview about you know going to bathgap.com and there's the email sign up and the podcast sign up and all kinds of things and that's all pretty obvious and uh, if you just go there and poke around in the menus you'll you'll find some interesting things so uh, appreciate everyone hanging in there with us this long if you have and yeah, I hope we didn't bore you to death <laughs> well the online people have remained around 70 the whole time so uh, they, ha they haven't hung up unless they left their computer running and went to eat lunch or something <laughs> 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 okay. But we've also gotten quite a few questions on this one. Usually not that many questions are sent in, so it seems yeah. like there was a lot, a lot of interest. So appreciate it. And um, next week I'll be speaking with Su Su is, excuse me, Suzanne Giesman, who um, had an interesting experience. She was like a career military woman, a commander in the Navy and all, and then she had this huge change in her life where she became like a medium and all kinds of interesting things. So you'll, you'll see that one next week. And the week after that is Byron Katie, which will be very popular. So thanks for listening or watching, and we'll see you then.